So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we are here with uh, Dr. Stacy Locke, Kirk Matheson, and Melanie Stevenson. Uh, the three of them are going to present today on the various topics of uh, pulmonary fibrosis, of what you need to know, and about health and um, exercise. And um, it's my honor to introduce them. Our first presenter is uh, Dr. Stacy Look. And Stacy is a respirologist and current recipient of the 2019 2020 CPFF Robert Davidson Fellowship. Uh, currently completing her intertitial lung disease fellowship at the University of Calgary under the supervision of Drs. Carrie Johansson and Charlene Fell. She completed her medical school internal medicine and respirology residence at the University of Saskatchewan. She will be returning to Saskatoon to join Dr. Veronica Moreau in the intertitial lung disease program as of January 2020. All right, thanks, Sharon. Um, I just wanted to thank the CPFF for um, making my fellowship possible this year. And, and then we'll get straight into things, I guess. So, okay. Great, so I'm going to be talking about diagnosis and treatment of interstitial lung disease today. Um, and this is a pretty broad topic, so we'll kind of be going in broad strokes, but we're going to start off with um, just talking about what is interstitial lung disease and how, we, how do we diagnose it. I think the best way to go through this is to go by cases. So I created four fictitious cases today um, of different patient scenarios and when we would use each drug. So I don't bore you guys with all my pharmacology talk. Um, then we'll talk about the drugs within those slides, as well as their side effects. And then we'll talk a little bit about non-pharmacotherapeutic treatments as well. So what is interstitial lung disease? So I tell patients often, you know, interstitial, saying that you have interstitial lung disease is like saying that you have a dog. There are so many different types with over 200 subtypes overlapping in clinical and radiologic features. So sometimes the diagnosis is difficult to make. Um, most of our data and most of our posters and everything like that is for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis because it's the most common and most well studied. We estimate that idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis affects about 40 um, Canadians in 100,000 over the age of 50. So it's not a rare disease. And we know that the median survival is three to five years from time, the time of diagnosis. And the reason why I include this data is this is pre-treatment data. Um, but we know that it's a serious condition and we take it very seriously. And we're very happy to know that there are drugs for this condition now. So what is the issue with interstitial lung disease? So I've got a nice um, cartoon image here of the lungs. So I describe the lungs as two upside down trees um, with branches. So the branches are the airways um, and the interstitium is where the leaves of the trees would be. So at the end of each of these um, tips of the branches, there's these air sacs called alveoli, and that's where all the business happens. Um, that's where all the gas exchange occurs with oxygen and CO2 um, with the bloodstream. So the interstitium is that in-between support network, and when that support network gets scarred, um, all the business of the oxygen and CO2 um, exchange gets impaired. And so we can notice that often people require oxygen after they have significant scarring in their lungs. This is a very complicated picture here and I've kind of drawn on it myself with that vapors, dust, gas and fumes thing. Um, but this is what's happening at the cellular level. So we know that there's these cells called fibroblasts and they lay down scar in the lungs. And there's lots of different mediators at play in different white blood cells, but essentially something from someone's environment, whether it be vapors, dust, gas, fumes, um, their uh, autoimmune condition, um, a drug that they took, some sort of genetic predisposition, an infection or radiation, something happens to someone um, and it causes some sort of trigger to the epithelial cells in the lungs and subsequently starts this cascade of inappropriately laying down scar. 
Um, and so the pathway to the left is for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and the pathway to the right is for scleroderma lung disease. And you can see that there's different cells and different mediators at play, but the end result is fairly similar that scar gets laid down. And you know, sometimes we don't actually know what was the actual cause, and that's the term idiopathic, meaning we don't really know, um, but certainly it does cause this cascade. So how do we classify interstitial lung disease? So we classify it by cause. So the first category being exposure related. So occupational exposures, things like silicosis. Um, so that would be like from sandblasting or mining and silica rock. Um, environmental um, causes is a huge um, component as well, like breathing in things like molds or bird feathers and having an inappropriate reaction to them in the lungs. Well as medications. The second large category is connective tissue disease, things like scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis. Sarcoidosis is an entity into itself. Um, we don't necessarily know what causes it, um, but it has uh, effects on many different organs in the body, one of which being the lungs. Idiopathic is this grab bag category where we don't know what necessarily causes it, but the um, literature is very well described for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, there's also RBILD and DIP, which are smoking related. And then there's this other category, which is um, kind of a miscellaneous category and includes a lot of different things. So longer hand cell histiocytosis is often caused by smoking. Um, lymphangitic leiomyomatosis is in young females and usually causes cysts. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different types. So how do we make the diagnosis? We start off with a detailed history. So we talk to our patients, we ask them um, all about their symptoms. We ask about autoimmune symptoms specifically. Um, so things that would cause um, rheumatoid arth or symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, things like rashes, joint pain, skin thickening. We ask about exposures. Um, we like to take a detailed history of someone's previous occupations. Um, as well, we ask about all these organic exposures, such as molds uh, and feather exposures, which can cause hypersensitivity and pneumonitis. We ask about drugs, chemotherapy, radiation, and any family history of interstitial lung disease or an autoimmune condition. So then we start with a physical examination as well. So we'll measure someone's oxygen saturation at rest. Often with interstitial lung disease, until the disease is moderate to severe, uh, we won't actually see any issues with oxygenation at rest. Usually, uh, we walk our patients in clinic, and that's why we do a six-minute walk test so frequently, um, is that we know that with interstitial lung disease, the vulnerable times are when people exert themselves. We'll often see those are the times that people's oxygen drop, and so we um, will have to do that. Otherwise, um, um, hypoxemia on exertion could be missed. We also check for the fingers um, or check for clubbing in the fingers and I've included an image down in the bottom corner. Um, it's not present in all interstitial lung diseases but we know that it can be a sign of this and it is not present in COPD. So we do look for it um, because sometimes that can be a clue of something going on but it is a non-specific sign so it's present in things like liver cirrhosis and, and can sometimes just be um, running in families. So it's, it doesn't necessarily mean someone has interstitial lung disease, but it is a clue. We then listen to the chest and um, specifically with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we can hear these Velcro crackles to the bases of the lungs. Um, so they're not coarse crackles like we would hear in heart failure. They sound a little bit different. And then these inspiratory squeaks can sometimes be a clue that the interstitial lung disease is secondary to hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So that squeak kind of sounds like a beep, um, maybe like a baby chicken or something like that. Um, and that's quite specific. Then we do a full rheumatological exam from head to toe looking for any signs of an autoimmune condition like joint pains and or joint arthritis in the hands um, and looking at any skin thickening or rashes. We always have our patients do these breathing tests and it seems to be the bane of every patient's existence because they're quite difficult to do. And when we're in respirology training, we have to do these breathing tests on ourselves so that we know how hard it is for patients. And I have to say when I did one myself um, in my training program, um, I think the first time I did it, they told me I had poor effort. So, and there's nothing wrong with my lungs. So I definitely um, sympathize for those people who find these pulmonary function tests to be quite difficult. Um, the pattern that we see with pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease 
we see that the spirometry, that forceful one where you blow out from top to bottom, um, has a reduction in how much you can blow out in one second, as well as how much you can blow out altogether. So this is represented as a percentage, and that percentage of, is of what we would predict someone to do for their age, height, and gender. So we have kind of a reference range. So for example, this person did 69% of what we would expect, um, and anything above 80% we would consider to be normal. The second component of this test is something called lung um, volumes. So we actually measure the volumes of the lungs and we know that it with pulmonary fibrosis or scarring in the lungs, the lungs tend to shrink. So you can hear, see here that the total lung capacity or the TLC is 61%. And again, anything above 80% would be considered to be normal. Then the last component is the diffusion capacity. So what that measures is the uh, ability for the lungs to take oxygen from the airways and to the air sacs and into the bloodstream. Um, and so that can often be the first thing to go on, an, on a pulmonary function test when we're looking at interstitial lung disease. And you could see here, this one is 59%. So that would be a moderate uh, reduction. We'll do a chest x-ray. So I've included a normal chest x-ray on the left and someone with pulmonary fibrosis on the right. Um, so you can see this lacy appearance throughout. Um, it kind of looks like an overlay. And so that's um, pulmonary fibrosis can look like that. We call that reticular markings. But ultimately chest x-ray is very a, a rough picture. It doesn't tell us a ton of details um, and certainly isn't the best for telling whether or not things are progressing. And so what we like to do is a high resolution CT scan, um, which is very thin cuts. So it's a little bit different than a regular CT scan um, because the picture quality is better and we're able to um, tell more by it. We also like to do certain protocols with our high resolution CT scans and I'll get into that uh, quickly or shortly here. So why I uh, include this loaf of bread here is when I describe to people how to look at a CT scan, I say, imagine that you're sitting through that or laying through that donut and that CT scan, what we're doing is we're slicing images of a loaf of, like a loaf of bread, kind of from the neck down to almost the belly. So you can see here on, um, on the left, the slice that we took of this person is from kind of head down, whereas on the right, um, the person is lying on their back, their heart is that white um, circular thing in the middle, um, white is more dense, so those are bones, and black is less dense with air in it, and so those are the lungs, and this is a normal CT scan. So if you imagine that the head is through the monitor and the, and the feet are pointing up to the ceiling um, kind of closer to you, um, that's kind of the reference range, and so we'll slice kind of from neck down. We like to do prone imaging. So I can't resist making a CAT scan joke. Um, so on the left here, we have our regular CT scan where we have people on their backs. And then we like to flip people over and put them on their stomachs. And so that's kind of specific to interstitial lung disease and the protocol that we like to do for our CT scans. Because you can see on the left, there's kind of this gray stuff in the black lungs um, pointed to by the arrows. And that's called dependent atelectasis. So what that is, is just the lungs, they're squishy. And when you lay on your back, the gravity causes the bottom parts of the lungs to squish. But that can sometimes look like interstitial lung disease. And so we don't want to be fooled. So we flip people over to make sure that it's not a gravity thing and just a bit of squishy lung. Um, and then often, um, if this is dependent atelectasis, we're able to say, hey, that's gone away. This is not interstitial lung disease. Um, so that's important for us to tell. Um, and that's kind of the best news, best case scenario when I can tell someone, hey, we flipped you over and we redid the CT scan and actually there's nothing going on there. The other thing we like to do is expiratory views. We get, usually when we do a CT scan, we do it when someone takes a deep breath in. Um, and when we scan someone when they've taken a deep breath out, we can often see this thing called air trapping uh, when someone has hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, so you can see how um, the lung usually gets more white when we expire because um, all the air is being deflated out of it, but there's these areas of blackness. So the picture on the left with the inspiration, that's called mosaic attenuation, where there's this patchiness. 
Um, and the, on the expiratory views, you can see there's some areas that are more black and some areas that are more white and some areas that are a middle gray. And we call that a head cheese appearance or a um, three dimension, I believe it's called, um, they, or three density appearance. Um, and that can be specific for chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So I like to do that to help us elicit a diagnosis. Now with the um, high resolution CT scans, there's many different patterns. I've included kind of the four main patterns that we see. Um, they each have a name for them. And those names of these high resolution CT patterns aren't a diagnosis. They're just a broad category of picture from which um, there is a bunch of different things that can cause it. So for example, usual interstitial pneumonia is categorized by um, basilar predominance, peripheral changes, um, often with honeycombing and attraction bronchiectasis. These are all just findings, but um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis was one of the causes of that. And you can see here other things like rheumatoid arthritis can also cause that picture. Chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis can also cause that picture and so on and so forth. And so there's long lists of things that all of us doctors have to memorize um, that do interstitial lung disease. And when we see these patterns, we have to put on our thinking caps and think of all these diagnoses. So the other tests that we do, we like to send people for blood work to rule out autoimmune conditions because sometimes the autoimmune conditions can be tricky to diagnose. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily know that they have them, and sometimes the first presentation can be interstitial lung disease. Um, and sometimes there are subtle little findings that we may ask about that people didn't realize were necessarily going on and thought that was just normal. And so we have to ask all the questions and we like to check the blood work as well. If there is a concern um, based on the CT scan, we may extend some of that blood work to do some of the more um, rare, can include some of the more rare conditions like scleroderma, lupus, myositis. As well, if we're really not um, clear on the diagnosis based on history and imaging, we may do something called a bronchoscopy. So a bronchoscopy is where we take a camera, um, we put it through the mouth and look in through the airways. We usually do something called a bronchoalveolar lavage, which is where we put some salty fluid through our scope swish it around the lungs and then um, suck it back out. And we look at the cells and that can help us to rule out other things that look like interstitial lung disease, like infections and cancers. Um, and it can also give us an idea of what drugs would be beneficial. Sometimes while we're in there with the scope, we'll take these tiny little alligator clips uh, or alligator forceps and we'll take a little chunk of lung that's kind of the size of a crumb. That's called a transbronchial biopsy. Now they're fairly safe, however, they do come with some risk, as do most uh, procedures, with a risk of bleeding as well as collapse of the lung. So we don't do it on everybody if we don't have to, um, but sometimes it's able to give us some information. This is a picture of the bronchoscopy. This guy on the left is sleepy because we gave him some sedating medication, just as we would for a colonoscopy or something like that. And he's had the back of his neck or of his throat frozen with some an anesthetic. Um, so that he doesn't have a um, feel the scope, um, but sometimes people can have a bit of a sore throat after the procedure. Um, and on the right is that salty fluid going through the scope um, that will eventually suck back out and send away for testing. The gold standard diag um, diagnostic um, criteria for making a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease is something called a multidisciplinary discussion. And all that means is a, an expert chest radiologist, as well as an expert chest pathologist, person who looks at tissue, um, as well as a um, respirologist, ideally with ILD training, sits around a table um, and they all go through these cases together, looking at um, the um, high resolution CT chest, as well as the clinical picture, and any um, tissue that we have or cells that we have if we did any further testing with a pathologist. Uh, and then we sit around, we decide what um, diagnosis fits best. Sometimes we're not able to make that diagnosis based on the round table discussion, um, but often it can be quite helpful when we all sit together and um, collaborate. And usually we are able to make a diagnosis. Sometimes we decide that we need further testing 
And if that's the case, then at least we know the direction that we need to go in. So one thing that we can do is something called a surgical lung biopsy. That's a little bit different than taking a transbronchial biopsy, which is the one that we go through the mouth um, with a little tiny, tiny um, forcep and take a little crumb sized piece of lung. Um, whereas this surgical lung biopsy is usually done under or is done under general anesthetic. So we would sedate a person, take over their breathing with a ventilator. We would also, a thoracic surgeon would do this. They would um, cut in between the ribs, um, deflate the lung and take a piece of tissue, probably the size of a loony. Okay. So sometimes that can be helpful to make a diagnosis. We don't send everybody for that procedure because it is associated with a 2% mortality rate, meaning 2% of people who undergo this procedure will pass away in, from it. Um, so we don't take that lightly. Um, and so a lot of um, what we do can be, um, the diagnosis can be made without a biopsy, um, but we will often um, or sometimes go through the, with the surgical lung biopsy if we think that it'll help change the management of a patient. Now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about drugs. So the first two drugs that we have in the list are antifibrotic drugs. So profenadone or esbriet and nitetidib or OFEV. And so these drugs are indicated for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, as well as OFEV is indicated for scleroderma and newly um, approved Health Canada uh, recommendation for approval for um, progressive fibrotic interstitial lung disease. Um, however, we don't have uh, that on our formulary currently. The next category of medications are immunosuppressive drugs like prednisone, Celsept, um, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab. And so those medications are typically used for things like hypersensitivity pneumonitis or a disease related to connective tissue diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or scleroderma. We're gonna start with our first case, Mr. J. He's a 68 year old retired firefighter Again, this is a fictitious case. I made, made this gentleman up. Um, he presents with cough and has been for the last two years. He's noticed that he's more short of breath in the last year and has had some difficulties with mowing his lawn this last summer. He also notices he has some difficulties when he takes his dog for a walk and he has to stop every few blocks to catch his breath. He doesn't really have much for medical conditions except for a little bit of high blood pressure, high cholesterol. No family history of any autoimmune conditions in his family, and certainly nobody has any history of interstitial lung disease. He has a remote history of smoking and has um, smoked for about five years when he was in his 20s, because he said everybody was doing it at the time. Um, he has no symptoms of autoimmune disease or exposures to anything that he knows of, including bird feathers um, and things like molds. So when I examine him, he's got um, his oxygen saturation is 90% on room air, meaning room air just means breathing the room within the air, no oxygen. Um, we examine his fingers and we notice that clubbing, so there's that roundness of his fingernails, which is kind of a bit odd and maybe a tip off that he has interstitial lung disease. We listen to his lungs and we notice that there's some fine Velcro crackles to the bases when we listen. There's no signs of other rheumatological conditions when we examine his joints as well. We looked at his skin for things like skin tightening that can be in scleroderma and he doesn't have any of that. We send off his blood work for autoimmune conditions and it all comes back negative. And we decide that we're gonna walk him in our clinic as we always do for approximately six minutes. And we notice that his oxygen drops to 72%, which would be a criteria that he would meet oxygen. Um, or meet qualification for oxygen when he exerts himself. So this is his chest x-ray. There's these um, reticular changes, like we said, that lacy appearance kind of overlaying um, his lungs, uh, mostly to the bases of the lungs. You can see on, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but on the left uh, diaphragm, which is the white part that connects the black of the lungs to the stomach, but, uh, that muscle. Um, and there is, um, you can kind of see, you can't quite clearly trace that. So that is his right lung um, that's on the left of the screen. And then when we do a CT scan, we notice this honeycombing. So just like a bee, 
um, you've got these stacked cysts towards the outsides of the lungs and the airways are pulled open. That's called traction bronchiectasis. What that is, is the tissue surrounding the airway becomes scarred and that scarring pulls the airways and makes them look more dilated. Um, so uh, he has evidence of scarring. And I, we would call this a typical UIP pattern. So we meet at the multidisciplinary discussion with our chest radiologist colleagues, and they say, yes, this is a typical UIP pattern. Um, and as a result, I say, you know, there's no connective tissue diseases at play here. Um, there's nothing in his environment, no other drugs that could have caused this. Um, and we're left with a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And we decide based on that, we have enough information that we don't need a surgical lung biopsy or to do a bronchoscopy. We give him some oxygen for when he walks because we know that his oxygen was dropping and we offer him treatment with an antifibrotic therapy, either perfenidone or nintedinib. So we're gonna start with perfenidone. Um, in terms of medications, just to get some more information about it. So perfenidone is a pill that we take three times a day. Um, it's for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. That's the only indication. And we know that by taking this perfenidone, we reduce the chances or the rate of lung decline in the future. Um, it is not a cure, but we know that um, progression does occur with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and this slows things down. We know that with this drug, we've been able to improve exercise tolerance um, and uh, reduce hospital rates. And with that slowing of the scarring of the lungs, we're able to make people live longer, which is a good thing. The side effects of this medication, so often, you know, the main side effect will be stomach upset, so nausea in about 36%. Um, there's also a rash associated with perfenidone or esbriate, um, especially when you're going out into the sun. I'll tell my patients to wear, you know, that big floppy hat, um, lots of sunscreen, um, those UV shirts are really uh, trendy right now, those are a good idea, the long sleeve ones. Um, and so that can be some of the main side effects with perfenidone. The second antifibrotic, and I should mention between these two antifibrotics, neither one of them works any better than the other. Um, so I always leave it up to my patients in terms of which medication they choose based on either frequency, side effects, and what fits best into their lifestyle. Um, Excuse me, Dr. Luck. Um, yeah. There is a question. Uh, somebody yeah. was wondering if you could explain what formulary is. Oh, okay. So each uh, province has a drug formulary, um, which they decide which drugs are going to be covered. Um, and so unless something's on the formulary, we can't prescribe it for that indication. So it can be approved for Health Canada, but it will not be covered by the formulary in each province. And so um, that has, um, so Health Canada approval means that this drug is safe and indicated for this condition, and each province has their own drug formulary. And so across Canada, none of the formularies have made a decision based on that medication yet, but I believe Alberta is making their decision hopefully within the next month. I hope that clears things up. Oh, thank uh, you. Yeah. So the next drug is nintedinib, um, an antifibrotic medication as well. Um, and so it's a pill twice a day. Um, the indication as well for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but it is also indicated for um, fibrotic interstitial lung disease with scleroderma, uh, as well as progressive fibrotic interstitial lung disease, which is a bit of a grab bag um, term, but basically anyone who has a fibrotic interstitial lung disease that's getting worse. Um, that's kind of what I was talking about where that Health Canada has just recently approved it, which is very exciting, um, but it hasn't been put on our provincial drug formularies yet. Um, so the benefit of this medication as well is that it slows things down by about 50% um, in terms of decline in lung function. And this is again associated with a survival benefit as well it reduces hospitalizations. So also a very good drug. The side effects are a little bit different than the perfenidone. Um, so diarrhea in about half to 60% of people. Now that diarrhea, often we're able to get it under control with a little bit of emodium. 
um, or reducing the dose. So often people won't have to discontinue the drug based on this, but sometimes the diarrhea can be quite profound. Um, and even with Imodium and reducing the dose, sometimes that doesn't work and we do have to discontinue the drug. But I always tell people, you know what, you might be that lucky half of people that don't have the diarrhea, so it's worth a shot. Um, and then nausea as well as decreased appetite. Um, both of these medications we always monitor with monthly blood work to check our liver enzymes and cell counts to make sure there's no drug reactions causing any issues. Um, as well with um, nintedineb um, or ofed, there can be an increased risk of uh, bleeding when combined with other anticoagulations. Um, so if you're on aspirin as well as Plavix and then ofev, that there could be an increased bleeding risk with that. Um, so it's not a contraindication, meaning that we wouldn't have to start, stop the drug absolutely, but it should be a conversation that we discuss with our patients um, if that is the case. So our next case is Mr. P. Um, he's a 50-year-old high school biology teacher. He's been noticing some cough over the last um, six months with some wheezing and breathlessness, uh, which he noticed starting this spring after he started going hiking outside again. He otherwise is a healthy, healthy guy, no other medications. No one in his family has an interstitial lung disease or an autoimmune condition. He's a lifetime never smoker. Um, he has no symptoms of any autoimmune conditions. And he does, however, note that he's had some pet budgies in his home, which he's owned for the last four years. And he loves them dearly. So he's noticed that our, when we check his oxygen um, in our clinic, his oxygen is 94% and he's not on any oxygen. Um, we listen to the bottoms of his lungs and we also notice these fine Velcro crackles, just like our first patient, Mr. J. Um, but the other thing that we hear is those inspiratory squeaks, as well as a little bit of a mild wheeze, which is a bit different than our first patient. He has no signs of a rheumatological condition. Um, we send off his blood work for autoimmune conditions and there's, those are all negative. We also do a walk test in our clinic and we notice his oxygen drops to 87%. So even though it drops, um, he doesn't qualify for exertional oxygen at this time. Um, and then we decide after that that we should do a bronchoscopy. And so he's agreeable and we, we do this bronchoscopy, we uh, do that BAL or bronchial alveolar lavage where we put that salty fluid in we suck it back out and we send it off to the pathologist to look at it and they say that there's 50% lymphocytes. So a lymphocyte is a white blood cell and we look at all the different white blood cells and um, what percentage makes up um, the whole of uh, the total. And we know that lymphocytes in a normal lung usually are, are anything between like 10 to 15%. Um, so 50% um, would be elevated. And we can often see that in hypersensitivity pneumonitis as well as autoimmune conditions. So when we do a CT scan of his lungs, we again notice that reticular markings or that lacy appearance that's evidence of scar. Um, we also notice that mosaic attenuation. So there's kind of some black and some um, more gray patches. We, we discuss him at that multidisciplinary discussion with the chest radiologist and pathologist, and they say, you know what, his imaging as well as his story and his, um, and his uh, fluid that came back from his bronchoscopy are all consistent with hypersensitivity pneumonitis, um, which would be secondary to uh, the bird feather um, that he was breathing in, his budgies. Um, the other name for that is bird fancier's lung. Um, so we decide we don't need to do any other further investigations. The main um, thing that we would like him to do is to remove his bird from his home, um, as well as the cage and all of the bird paraphernalia, as that bird is making him sick. And we discuss with him that he needs to do a full deep clean of his house, and we need to clean out all of the air vents and all the ducts in his house. Um, and then we offer him some treatment, because he's quite short of breath, um, with some prednisone, initially, and then we like to get people off of prednisone eventually, so we'll, we'll offer him either cell step therapy or Imuran.
So these are immunosuppressive drugs, not an antifibrotic drug, just like the first patient with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis um, who received that. So this is a different category of drugs. So I'm including this table here, and this is not an exhaustive, exhaustive table of all the different causes of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, but hypersensitivity pneumonitis is caused by some form of organic exposure in someone's environment. So there's many different kinds um, depending on the type. So kind of in the left-hand column is the, um, the fancy name for it. So there's bird breeder's lung, cheese worker's lung, salami worker's lung, the antigen source of what actually causes it, um, and then the specific antigen. So um, there can be sometimes bacteria that cause it and molds um, and funguses. So that's all included in there. So prednisone, a lot of uh, our patients have been on it, and it's a medication that works well for what it's intended for, but it comes with a lot of side effects. Um, so sometimes it's a bit of a necessary evil to get as much um, control over the disease as we can, um, especially when things are getting worse. And we use it for hypersensitive pneumonitis, we use it for connective tissue diseases, um, IPAF, which is this um, diagnosis that we give um, or category, it's a kind of a research term, but it, we sometimes use it as a diagnosis of um, interstitial lung disease of people who look like they have a connective tissue disease or their lungs look like they have a connective tissue disease, but they don't fit nicely into a category. So that's what IPAF is. We use this medication for that as well. Um, as well, we use prednisone in an acute exacerbation of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So someone had a flare of their in, idio, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF, we'll use this medication. Um, but we don't use it chronically in IPF. Um, so the side effects of prednisone can be um, quite tough on patients. Um, so it can cause a lot of issues with sleep disturbance. Um, a lot of people will find that they get kind of the munchies at night where they're raiding their fridge and they need to eat a lot. And as a result, they gain weight. Um, it can cause mood disturbances. And even in the worst case scenario, it can cause suicidal ideation. Um, so it is quite serious um, or can be quite serious. Um, other things it can cause is uh, the adrenal glands in the body produce steroid for the rest of the body or cortisol. So what happens is when prednisone gets introduced as a synthetic form of that, the adrenal glands get lazy and they no longer produce that cortisol that they're supposed to. And so over a long period of time, after about 21 days, um, the adrenal glands stop doing what they're supposed to um, and they rely on the prednisone to do some of it. So we know that this is not a medication that we can stop cold turkey. It's one that we need to taper off of after you've been on it for 21 days. Anything shorter than that, it's probably okay to just stop it. Uh, but certainly, um, sometimes we'll use prednisone for months and months on, on end, um, and especially at high doses. Um, there's a lot of concern that the adrenal glands will become lazy, so we have to kind of taper off. Um, there's also a concern of, you know, high doses over a long period of time causing diabetes and osteoporosis or weakening of the bones. It can also cause issues with the eyes like cataracts and glaucoma. Um, so it's not a drug that we like to continue long term, certainly at a high dose. Sometimes in our connective tissue disease patients will continue a very low dose of prednisone and that just helps keep um, all their autoimmune symptoms at bay. Um, but usually a rheumatologist will do that with us, um, but that can sometimes be the case. And you know, a lower dose of prednisone does not have as many side effects as the high dose. So when we have someone on a high dose of prednisone for a long period of time, we like to give their uh, bones some calcium and vitamin D to kind of combat that bone weakness that can happen with prednisone. As well, we will put someone on an antibiotic, um, either septra or atovaquone, for this specific um, fungus um, that's called PJP, or pneumocystis gyrovesciae pneumonia. So when someone's on a dose of prednisone for greater than 20 milligrams um, for a long period of time, um, we will start this uh, antibiotic and that septra or it's a sulfa drug is usually every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Or um, if someone is on uh, multiple immunosuppressive therapies 
or if they're high risk, we'll also start them on an antibiotic to prevent this. So that's another drug that we use. So let's um, talk about mycophenolate mofetil or Cellcept. So this is an immunosuppressive therapy. Um, we use this medication for hypersensitivity pneumonitis or connective tissue disease related interstitial lung disease or that IPATH um, thing again. Um, we use that as a pill twice a day. And we know that this medication helps to stabilize or improve lung function um, in hypersensitivity pneumonitis and interstitial lung disease related to connective tissue disease. We know that it helps patients improve um, their shortness of breath, their skin thickening for scleroderma, as well as improve the quality of life in patients with scleroderma. So we know that this is a good drug. Um, it does come with some side effects, but generally this medication is tolerated quite well, which is why we like to take people off of the prednisone and get them onto some of these other drugs. So mycophenolate mofetil can cause some um, stomach upset primarily and a little bit of diarrhea, um, but generally most of my patients are able to tolerate this medication fairly well. There is a risk of low blood cell counts as well as um, we always monitor liver enzymes. So again, we uh, check monthly blood work on this medication. There is a reported risk of cancers. Um, with all of our immunosuppressive medications, but I will say that's with a caveat, okay? Um, so this uh, mycophenolate mofetil or Cellcept was initially studied in lung transplant patients, um, which lung transplant does carry a small risk of cancers. Um, so the cancer risk that we are quoting is from um, lung transplant patients, and it's not from interstitial lung disease patients. So I'm actually doing a study on this with Dr. Johansson to see if we can better characterize what that risk actually is, or if there is a risk at all. Um, so, but it is mentioned on the, on, as one of the risks. We don't like to use this drug in anyone who has had a reaction before, or if they're pregnant or breastfeeding. And we also will potentially reduce the dose if someone is elderly um, or has issues with their kidneys. The second immunosuppressive therapy I'll talk about is azathioprine. Um, so this is a pill twice a day. Again, it's used for the same indications as Cellcept. So um, it's used for or sorry, um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, um, connective tissue related interstitial lung disease and IPATH. And we know that it stabilizes lung function and can improve lung function for um, both E and um, CTD, ILD. So side effects, um, a little bit more side effects than the Cellcept can cause some stomach upset again. Um, we always measure liver enzymes on this medication with monthly blood work to start um, because of a concern of liver dysfunction. As well, again, a small risk of cancer has been associated. Um, and we always monitor blood cells as well. We also check everyone for this TMPT enzyme. Um, the reason being is sometimes genetically, some people can lack this enzyme and therefore can't break down the azathioprine drug into um, its parts that work actively. Um, and so as a result, they can get to uh, toxicity on this medication. So we always check that level before starting anyone on that drug. Well, that brings us to our third case, Mrs. M. She's a 50-year-old lady that works as a bank teller. Um, she's noticed some tightening in her hands as well as her face, um, as well as she's had some ulcers kind of to the tips of her fingertips that she doesn't really, didn't really notice too much about it before until I brought it up in clinic and she said, yeah, that has been a thing that's been happening to me. She's noticed over the last little bit that she walks slower than her husband but she's otherwise healthy, not on any medications. Her mother, she said, had bad rheumatoid arthritis, um, and she's noticed herself that she gets a little bit of arthritis in her knuckles. She has some difficulties with swallowing foods occasionally and, and does notice that she'll choke at the dinner table. Um, she has noticed that her fingers, when she goes grocery shopping and grabs something like a bag of frozen peas, will turn white or blue in the cold. She has never smoked. When we examine her, her oxygen again is 91% um, without any oxygen. Um, we listen to her lungs and we notice that there's again some fine Velcro crackles to the bases of her lungs, uh, as well as bronchial breath sounds, which kind of is that sound of like Darth Vader, that 
what it sounds like when we listen to the chest. Um, we notice that there's some skin thickening to her hands and her face. Um, as well, she, the clinic room is quite cold, and so she notices that she's getting gray nose um, or whitening of her fingertips, which is included in a picture on the right. Um, as well, she's got these little tiny blood vessels um, that um, are present on her skin, um, to her chest, as well as on her face. And you can see a picture of the skin tightening on her hands as well in the right side image on the bottom. So we send her blood work off um, and she has a positive ANA, which is a screening test for autoimmune disease. Um, and it's highly positive. And then we also uh, notice that she has a positive anti-SCL70, which is a antibody that's positive in scleroderma. We do a walk test on her and we see that her oxygen drops to 88%. And again, in a normal person, we would actually expect oxygen to increase um, when we walk because our bodies will naturally start dilating uh, vessels and improve oxygenation to different parts of our lungs uh, when we exercise. So any drop in oxygen is abnormal. Um, so even though she doesn't qualify for oxygen therapy, um, that is uh, a sign that something is going on. So with the CT scan, um, we notice that she's got the, these areas of something called brown glass. So if you imagine a glass bottle in a parking lot that's been run over by 20 cars, it kind of creates that white hazy look. So you'll see on the picture on the right towards the bases of the lungs, there's this kind of white um, discoloration um, throughout the lungs, um, which isn't necessarily present at the top parts of the lungs on the image on the, on the left hand side. We'll also notice, so that big black circle in the middle is the windpipe or the trachea, and behind it is the esophagus. So that esophagus actually looks quite big when compared to our other CT scan. Um, and so that can also be a sign of scleroderma because the esophagus is affected and can become quite dilated. Um, so her CT pattern would not be a UIP pattern. It would be called something, uh, it would be called NSIP. Um, so, She's diagnosed with scleroderma interstitial lung disease based on her positive serology um, and her story. And her CT scan demonstrates an NSIP pattern, which can be quite typical of scleroderma. And we decide that um, we need to see her with a rheumatologist. Um, and the rheumatologist sees her and she says, yep, this is uh, scleroderma for sure. So we're able to make the diagnosis of scleroderma interstitial lung disease. We don't need to do any biopsies of her lungs. We do recommend, however, that she get an annual echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart, um, to screen for pulmonary hypertension, which is high blood pressures in the um, right-sided right -sided vessels of the heart um, that can be secondary to scleroderma that can happen. So we always look for it every year because um, there are drugs that we can use for that. Um, so we offer her treatment with Celsept or mycophenolate mofetil. Again, we had talked about that medication. And later we decide that we're also going to start an antifibrotic, so tetanib or OFEV is also can be indicated for this condition. Um, and then if the mycophenolate mofetil fails or she's starting to get sicker, um, we may consider cyclophosphamide, which is an IV therapy also indicated for this condition. Cyclophosphamide is an IV um, medication. It can also be a pill by mouth. But usually at our clinic anyways, we use it as an IV infusion every two to four weeks. It's a very potent immunosuppressive medication. And I should mention with all of these immunosuppressive medications, there is a risk of infection. Um, so this would be one of the more potent ones. And it does come with a lot of side effects. But having said that, it is a very strong medication. And when we need it, we're able to gain a lot of lung function back sometimes. Um, so we will use it if we have to. Um, so it, it treats connective tissue diseases such as scleroderma. I also use it in some of my myositis patients. Um, it can also be indicated for vasculitis, uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis, but we don't use it too often for that indication, as well as IPAF. Um, so the benefits, it can stabilize or improve lung function. It can improve shortness of breath. Um, skin thickening for scleroderma and health-related quality of life for scleroderma as well. We know that um, in patients with refractory 
um, disease in hypersensitivity pneumonitis that it prevents the decline in um, forced vital capacity, which is that one marker we use on the lung function test. Um, as well, it's, it's demonstrated improvement for those with um, improvement in the forced vital capacity for those with IPAF. So the side effects can be quite um, troublesome on this medication. Um, so it does have a risk of bladder cancer um, because of how the drug sits in the bladder after the IV infusion. So I will tell people to drink lots of fluids on the days that they get their cyclophosphamide infusion. It can also cause irritation of the bladder and bleeding within the bladder, and that's called hemorrhagic cystitis. So again, important that we flush that drug through um, with lots of hydration. Um, we will also sometimes give another medication to um, help with that side effect. Um, as well, we, some people can notice hair loss. Um, it can cause infertility in both men and women, um, and you know can cause a lot of side effects. So. Um, this medication is a blessing, but it can be a curse as well for the side effects, but um, it, it definitely is very potent and can work when we need it to. Well, the last patient we have here is Mrs. R. And so she's a 60 year old female. She's a vet, retired veterinarian. She's been noticed that she has hot, uh, red swollen joints to her hands and wrists. And she actually has a known history of rheumatoid arthritis, which she was diagnosed 20 years ago and is on Plaquenil and Methotrexate for. She notices now though that she has some difficulties getting out of bed in the morning due to lack of energy. She doesn't believe that her rheumatoid arthritis is necessarily under control. Um, and she notices that she's had a lot of difficulties with breathing, especially when she's walking at an incline. So she's a smoker. She smokes about half pack per day for the last 40 years. She has a sister with lupus. Um, I have a little typo on there. I said lifetime never smoker. No, she is a smoker. Um, so um, on physical examination, we check her vitals and her saturations are 94% without any oxygen on. We again listen to her lungs. She's got those fine Velcro crackles and she's got hot swollen joints over her knuckles um, as well as her wrists. And I've included a radiographic image of um, the joints that are usually affected in rheumatoid arthritis. Why I say this is the joints towards the tips of the fingers or closer to the fingernails, those are called the DIP joints. Those ones are more affected in osteoarthritis, but usually aren't affected in rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, my, my light went off in here. It's energy efficient. I have to move around and make it go on again. <laughs> Otherwise I'll be sitting in the dark. Um, so yeah, so I include that image on there because of the, uh, this helps us um, in terms of which joint is affected to know whether or not this is osteoarthritis, a wear and tear arthritis, or rheumatoid arthritis, which is a, an inflammatory arthritis. So we send off the blood work and she does have a positive rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP, which are both indicated for, um, are implicated for rheumatoid arthritis. And we walk her, her oxygen drops to 86%. Her CT scan demonstrates again that reticular markings towards the bases of the lungs. She's got some traction bronchiolectasis where the airways are being pulled, um, but there's no evidence of honeycombing on this. She still um, falls onto the category of a UIP pattern, and she UIP pattern is uh, can be typical for rheumatoid arthritis related interstitial lung disease. So that diagnosis is made both with the multidisciplinary discussion as well as with her rheumatologist. So because of her smoking history, we recommended that she quit smoking as we know that when someone has interstitial lung disease and they continue to smoke, that can cause a progression of their lung disease. Um, so that's first and foremost. I tell people that um, quitting smoking is one of the most important treatments that you can do for yourself. It works better than any of the drugs that we'll ever give you. Um, and it helps with so many other things outside of your lung disease, like risk of cancer in the rest of the body, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. So smoking cessation is first and foremost. So she's able to quit smoking with, a, with the help of maybe some nicotine patches. Um, we offer her treatment with immunosuppressive therapy of mycophenolate mofetil or Celsept. But after that uh, medication, it seems that it's not really working. She still has a lot of joint pains in her hands because the mycophenolate mofetil doesn't help um, the joints. It only treats the rheumatoid lung condition. 
So we often will continue people on their Plaquenil or methotrexate or other medications that they're on for their joints. Um, methotrexate, there was a concern previously that that may cause progression of scar in the lungs because um, methotrexate is one of the drugs on the list that can cause interstitial lung disease. But we know now that in our patients with rheumatoid arthritis, that when we continue the methotrexate, as long as the methotrexate isn't, cause it, isn't causing the lung disease, um, that we know that those patients tend to do better when we continue their methotrexate. Um, so we, we actually, based on that data, will continue um, patients' methotrexate in addition to the other drugs we start. So, you know, after she started on the CELSEPT, it's noticed that her joints are well controlled and she's had maybe a decline in her lung function. So we decide to switch her from the methotrexate and the CELSEPT into rituximab on its own. So rituximab is an IV infusion. It is given every six months. Um, we do initial loading dose at uh, day one and at two weeks. Um, so we use it for rheumatoid arthritis and interstitial lung disease, but it can also be used for many other indications. So we use it for um, vasculitis, um, other connective tissue diseases. Often we'll use it as a salvage therapy, meaning that all the other drugs haven't worked, um, and then we go to rituximab. We don't often tar stop, start rituximab in the beginning because, again, it's a more potent immunosuppressive medication. Um, so it does cause, you know, an increased risk of infections. Um, but this medication can be, again, uh, a lifesaver for a lot of people, um, and it does work quite effectively. Rituximab is also very expensive, so often in terms of provincial drug coverage, we have to fail a few therapies and prove that rituximab is needed. So the benefit is that it stabilizes and reduces the decline of lung function. Again, infections is a risk of this medication, um, a risk unique, oh my goodness. I'm really all for saving the environment, but turning off the lights every five minutes is not super helpful. Um, all right, um, so there is a risk of reactivation of tuberculosis and hepatitis B. So we always test people for hepatitis before we start this medication, uh, as well if someone is from an area where um, it's TB endemic, um, you know, where they may have been exposed to TB in the past, we always check for something called latent tuberculosis. It's not an active form of TB, um, but sometimes TB is a tricky uh, bacteria that can leave dormant in someone's immune system. And when we um, suppress that person's immune system, they can be at risk of having this TB, TB activate and cause an active infectious TB. Um, so we always like to check for that if someone comes for, from an area where TB is endemic or if they've been previously exposed to TB. So someone like a healthcare worker, um, et cetera. Um, there's also a risk of cancer like leukemias and lymphomas, um, but it's kind of a catch-22 because we also use rituximab to treat lymphomas. Yeah. So other things going into the non-drug um, therapies. So vaccination, we recommend that everyone with interstitial lung disease get the annual flu shot. I would recommend everybody get the annual flu shot, period. Um, so, you know, often people have had reactions to it in the past and they say, you know, I got kind of these aches and chills and, uh, you know, I didn't really like it when I got that flu shot. They do change the flu shot every year. So just because you had that reaction one year, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have it uh, the next year. The other thing I would say to that is, um, you know, these aches and chills and feeling unwell with the flu shot generally is going to be better than actually when someone were to get influenza. As we know that people with interstitial lung disease, if you get influenza, that can be a dangerous situation and you're more likely to end up in hospital. Um, so we would recommend everyone get the flu shot. We'd also recommend these two uh, pneumonia vaccines. So the pneumococcal 23 valent we um, recommend for everyone over the age of 65, but in our interstitial lung disease patients, you don't have to be 65 to get it. We would recommend it for everyone, as well as the Prevnar 13 vaccination. So if someone is immunosuppressed, um, so if you have rheumatoid arthritis, um, related interstitial lung disease, et cetera, um, and we're starting you on any of these immunosuppressive medications, we would recommend you also get the Prevnar 13 vaccine. Um, so the Prevnar 13 vaccine and the pneumococcal vaccine can both be given. They both cover four um, different strains of strep pneumonia, which is one of the most common bacteria to cause a bacterial pneumonia. 
doesn't cover for all of them, so you could still get pneumonia, um, just covers some, for some of the strains. And those are usually given with an eight week window apart from each other. The other thing we would recommend is a shingles vaccine. So if someone is immunosuppressed, we would recommend that they get the non-live version of the shingles vaccine or the Shingrix. Um, we, the concern is if, that, if someone's immunosuppressed, we give the live version of the shingles vaccine, they can get shingles. So we don't want that. So oxygen, so we talked about how oxygen um, on exertion can be quite helpful for relieving symptoms as well as it improves people's quality of life. Um, and you're able to do more with what you have is how I describe it. Um, so oxygen can also reduce the strain on the heart that can cause pulmonary hypertension. Um, so that repeated dip in oxygen over time, the heart feels that. Um, and so the pressures in the heart can start to build up and can actually lead to right heart failure if someone is left uh, untreated when they do require oxygen. So we do take it seriously. Um, and then pulmonary rehabilitation is an exercise program specifically for your lungs. And we know that the heart and the lung are married and the heart is a big muscle. And when we can improve that circulation of the muscle, uh, or sorry, circulation um, of the cardiovascular system and the muscle with the heart, um, we know that people tend to feel better. They're able to do more with what they have and have a better quality of life and do the things that they enjoy doing. Um, so we would recommend that they do um, pulmonary rehabilitation because of that. The lung function itself does not improve with uh, pulmonary rehabilitation, but like I said, the heart and the lung are married. So when one person um, is able to carry more of the weight, that's a good thing. So I'll briefly talk about um, lung transplant here. Um, so uh, lung transplant in itself is a whole other topic and a whole other talk. Um, but we know that lung transplant can be beneficial for some of our interstitial lung disease patients, and it is the second uh, most common reason that someone receives a lung transplant, secondary to COPD. Um, so lung transplant I describe as a trading of diseases. Um, you know, you have a very regimented life after a lung transplant where you see a bunch of doctors all the time. It's a huge major surgery and you have to take a lot of immunosuppressive drugs after the surgery to make sure that the lungs don't reject. Um, so it's not for everybody, but it can be uh, life-giving life for a lot of people. Um, and we know that this graph just shows the life expectancy with a lung transplant. So we quote anywhere between five to 10 years um, on average with a lung transplant. Of course, there are people that are outliers. Some people don't make it through the surgery as well. So we wanna make sure that we're picking um, the right people so that we're not actually shortening people's lives. Um, the other thing that um, I will say about lung transplant is it's a limited resource. Um, so we also want to make sure the person getting the lungs are, is the right recipient. Um, so things like smoking and all that is a, is a no-no if you're um, wanting a lung transplant because um, we want to make sure that someone's able to care for the lungs as well. We'll do a whole um, screening workup of someone's overall health to make sure the rest of their organs are healthy before we transplant um, new lungs into them. And we know that interstitial lung disease in this graph as a decent survival with um, lung transplant, pretty much middle of the road, um, with cystic fibrosis being the best in terms of transplant survival, um, because often people with cystic fibrosis who are transplanted are, are quite young. Um, they can be 20s and 30 years old, um, so the rest of their organs are, are quite healthy. So that's why cystic fibrosis patients probably live longer. Um, then there's also palliative care. So palliative care um, includes a whole different host of domains. Um, often people will um, confuse palliative care with just end of life care, but it should be more considered as a symptom control. Um, so, you know, things like opioids and all that we can use for breathlessness as well as um, sometimes we use cough suppressants like um, codeine cough syrup that with cough that can be quite troublesome to our ILD patients, um, especially you know when it's causing things like urinary incontinence. So palliative care is um, also a, definitely something that um, I would recommend. An organized palliative care approach doesn't currently exist and it leads to a lot of high symptom burden for interstitial lung disease. I think a lot of us could probably do a better job at including palliative care as part of our um, 
part of our interstitial lung disease care. And actually in Saskatchewan, Veronica Marcou and I are going to be starting a, interest, uh, a multidisciplinary palliative care clinic with some palliative care doctors in Saskatchewan. So that's kind of an exciting thing coming down the pipeline. Um, we know that palliative care in lung cancer has tended to increase patient survival. Um, so this whole thing about palliative care just being for people who are dying, um, that's not true. It actually does extend people's survival. We know that interstitial lung disease patients often have more breathlessness um, and untreated breathlessness than patients with lung cancer. However, they usually have less access to specialist care um, with palliative care. Um, the other thing I will mention about um, palliative care is Mina Kaleri in Edmonton is um, a specialist in palliative care and interstitial lung disease. She's an expert in the field and she wrote this paper and um, um, has noticed that a multidisciplinary collaborative interstitial lung disease clinic with palliative care leads to patients being 1.13 times more likely to die at home rather than in hospital or hospice. So that's a huge thing for a lot of our patients. And be something that um, would be quite beneficial for a lot of people. That concludes my talk. I know I um, included a lot of information in there, but um, hopefully you're all able to follow along and I didn't bore you to sleep. And um, we can talk about some of the um, things that we discussed. So we'll open up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Luck. Um, if our audience would like to send some questions in, please post them in the Q&A and I will uh, share them with uh, Dr. Locke. Hopefully my lights don't turn off again. <laughs> it took me a while to figure out in my office. I was sitting in there and I couldn't, I thought the light switch was broken. <laughs> and then I realized, no, it's motion sensor lights. Hey, it, it doesn't look like there's anything at the moment. So I'm just going to move on to, a, a, um, to a Kirk Matheson, who's a registered nurse with the Alberta Health Services in Calgary in Alberta. He has been the interstitial lung disease nurse clinician at the South Health Campus since 2012. And he founded the Calgary Pulmonary Fibrosis Support Group in 2013. And so, uh, Dr. Look, thank you very much for your presentation and welcome uh, Kirk Madison. Oh, thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, and uh, and uh, thank you to the CPFF for um, allowing me to come and talk um, and, uh, and, our, and for arranging all these great talks that you guys have done uh, through the whole month. Um, some great talk, talks and some excellent speakers. So uh, hopefully that's um, people are utilizing this resource. Um, thanks to Dr. Locke for that great presentation as well. I'm. Uh, Hoping to build a few things off of her talk as well. So we'll uh, kind of hopefully build off a few things, especially kind of the oxygen things. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, when Peggy McGee actually first asked me to talk to her Saskatoon group, I was kind of wondering, you know, what should I talk about? Um, and then it just kind of dawned on me, like, what do I spend, you know, most of my time talking in clinic about? And, and really what I talk about most of the time, um, you know, a lot of things is the educational resources when people are first diagnosed. Uh, also, I spend a lot of time talking about oxygen, and I think advanced care planning is another thing that we, we kind of miss out on a little bit, and then I just basically have a few kind of odds and ends I want to just kind of wrap up with, so um, we only got like 30 minutes, so we'll try to uh, get through this like we, uh, like we can. Um, so unless you're uh, a healthcare worker or familiar with pulmonary fibrosis in some way or had a, a loved one also affected with pulmonary fibrosis, most people kind of come to this diagnosis with an empty uh, toolbox and they don't have a lot of uh, resources to, to rely on when they're diagnosed. Um, and, and I know sometimes when they're diagnosed, uh, maybe the healthcare workers, the doctors, you know, don't have a lot of time to um, kind of give them a full uh, education on the, on the disease because there's a lot to it. So hopefully we're going to try to fill up our toolbox and give us some resources to kind of uh, live better with pulmonary fibrosis. So I've been nursing for quite a while. Um, been eight years uh, with the interstitial lung disease group here in Calgary. Uh, we did start the support group back in 2013. Um, but really up until eight, eight years ago, I didn't really know a lot about this disease either. I worked critical care and I'm sure I came across pulmonary fibrosis in the past, but a lot of the things, um, you know, you just don't, you don't realize it is, you know, more of a rare disease than, um, than a lot of other things. So, um, and I know when I first started this, job, you know, I, I did a ton of research and reading on, on interstitial lung disease to kind of familiarize myself with the disease. 
but really uh, most of the information that I got on this disease comes from patients and comes from talking to patients and learning from them and their experiences. So, and I think that's where, uh, that's the, that's the goal of my talk, you know, today is to try to, you know, educate some, some of you guys about, you know, the experiences that, that I've learned from others. So, um, so we can kind of, we don't all have to go through this alone and, and learn lessons the hard way. So, so when people are first diagnosed with this disease, I know um, they're oftentimes just not really sure what to do or, or where to go to get information. Um, you know, as Dr. Locke, you know, laid out in her presentation, you know, how to diagnose, you know, you know once you're diagnosed, this disease doesn't necessarily go, go away. Um, and so we're kind of challenged to change ourselves and, and to, you know, adapt to the disease uh, and figure out kind of where to go from here. And like I mentioned, most of you guys have not, you know, didn't really know a lot about this disease. So we don't really know where to go even for questions and stuff. So, so this is the situation we're in. So kind of what are we going to do next is, is kind of always the question. So I think one of the first um, emotions we come across is, is fear. I mean, a lot of people come into our clinic for the first time and they're, and the only thing they've had a chance to do is Google what pulmonary fibrosis is and it kind of tells them they're going to die in three to five months. And that's the only thing they understand. Um, and uh, so they, they come in here quite fearful and, and really don't really understand um, what's going to happen. Um, and I think that's kind of the most important aspect of education and healthcare is yes, we want to teach people about their disease so they can learn to live with it better, but it's really to reduce the fear and allow people to, um, you know, be participate in their healthcare uh, better and uh, you know, to properly understand it. So I think if we can, um, you know, channel that fear into um, activating us and motivating us to to learn more about this disease, I think we're going to be a lot better placed than we are where we're going to be scared and uh, uh, maybe stick our head in the sand and try to make it go away on it or think it's going to go away, but it's really not. So where do we go for information uh, to get informed? Um, I know when I first started this job, I, I was started to Google lots of information just to kind of figure out where to go from here. Um, but, you know, at this day and age, eight years later, there's a ton of resources out on the internet. In this day and age, the great thing is we have information at our fingertips at all times. Um, but we can get bogged down into, you know, non-useful sites and non-reputable sites. So I'd like to, you know, first send you to the Canadian Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation. They have got a wonderful website. Obviously, you guys have probably all been on that website because um, you're registered here. Um, but they have a, a, a ton of resources uh, on there for patients and, and caregivers, uh, as well as they have a list of other uh, reputable resources and websites to go to. So I, I strongly encourage to uh, surf through that and I'm sure you probably already have. Uh, the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation also has another wonderful website um, and, and that's based out of the United States and they have a, a ton of educational resources. They probably got, you know, hundreds of hours of videos to watch from, you know, experts in the field, you know, they do um, a pulmonary fibrosis summit. I think it's every two years, and um, and it's a it's a conference for healthcare workers or healthcare uh, experts, and then also for um, pulmonary fibrosis patients and families. So, and they've archived all of those past presentations and things. So you can actually hear from you know the world renowned experts on pulmonary fibrosis. You can go to those websites right now and and start looking at those videos. They're they're wonderful. They're excellent. Um, I've put the American Thoracic Society on there. There's not a ton of specific to pulmonary fibrosis in their website. They do have a little bit of things, but a lot of the education things they have that I use is um, some information on what pulmonary function testing is, six minute walk tests, CT scans, and that sort of thing. So there's some good education to be found there as well. And the Canadian Lung Association is another one that uh, has a lot of information as well. Not so much specific to interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, a lot of smoking cessation, things like that. But I put them on the list because I think, you know, going to a reputable site, which has, you know, these guys have, you know, medical boards that, you know, vet all the information that's put on their website. Um, so, you know, you're getting proper information from medical professionals in the interstitial lung disease um, field when you go to these websites. A little more about information vetting. Um, you know, just be, be careful of blind Google searches. You can really come up with a lot of information. And, and it may not be applicable to you. So just, um, it's, it's important to kind of go to, to the right places. Look for academic or reputable university websites. I know a lot of people go to the Mayo Clinic. 
uh, and they've got some information on their site. I actually went to, uh, when I was kind of searching for this topic and doing a little bit of research, I went to the uh, University of Calgary, Cal California San Francisco uh, University webpage, and they've got a ton of things on their ILD website, their information there as well. And I know that's where one of our doctors, Dr. Johansson trained. So um, there's a lot of information out there. Um, be careful about patient forums. Uh, they're a wonderful resource for patients to share information back and forth. But some people, if they're confused about their diagnosis or what they're dealing with, it may not apply to what someone else is, is reporting or what somebody else is, has uh, experienced. Uh, so it might not be applicable to you. You know, for instance, if somebody has scleroderma interstitial lung disease, they may be talking about their medications and, and you're wondering, you know, why can't you be on that, have that same medication because you have IPF or uh, something like that. So um, be careful about that. Look for up-to-date information. And then the last point is, you know, good information is free. Um, you don't really need to, you know, buy books or buy subscriptions to things to get uh, really good education um, and really good information. And then lastly, there's just really no quick fixes or miracle cures, so be mindful of that. Um, if we had a, a miracle cure or a quick fix for this disease, um, trust me, we would be all over it and, uh, and allowing you to use that anytime. I'm just going to quickly, this kind of reiterates what I just kind of said, but I stole this uh, um, slide from our, uh, Allison Pinches, who did a, uh, as a librarian with Alberta Health Services, who did a, a talk for our support group a few years ago about um, Dr. Google and some of the, the pitfalls with that. Um, so basically, like I had mentioned earlier, is the, re is the information current? Is it relevant to you and your lung disease um, specifically? Um, is, the, is the authority, is the author properly um, clearly stated and do they have, uh, you know, are they a reputable organization? Are they professional? What are their credentials? Um, and is the information accurate? Um, are there references provided? Is there evidence? You know, avoid testimonial evidence. You know, people say, oh, there's, you know, I took this medication and now I feel great, um, kind of testimonial stuff. Um, look for more evidence-based science facts. Um, and then lastly, what's the purpose of the information that you're, that you're viewing and what's the purpose of the website? Um, you know, if they're asking you to buy something, um, chances are that's their, that's their purpose is to get you to purchase something. So, like I said, uh, you know, information is free. Um, there's no quick fixes. So, you know, when you're Googling sites, just be careful and keep your uh, credit card in your wallet. So oxygen. Um, I spend a lot of time talking about oxygen. So I'm going to spend probably the majority of the talk uh, in the next few minutes just talking about oxygen because this is what I probably spend the majority of my time discussing. And I'm going to build a little bit on what Dr. Locke uh, mentioned in her presentation. Um, but then also just to reiterate, Dr. Johansson, one of our respirologists here in Calgary, is going to give a presentation uh, to the CPFF group on September 21st about interstitial lung disease and oxygen as well. And I think she'll go into a lot more of the uh, medical side effects or the medical uh, research and things behind oxygen. But I want to talk a little bit more of the applicable things. Um, so I find that most people are quite resistant to wearing supplemental oxygen. Uh, I think a lot of that resistance is to misunderstanding of how it's going to benefit them. Um, and why they really need it in the first place. And they worry a lot about the social stigma of, of it as well. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about the goals of therapy, of oxygen therapy and, and why it's used and why we would recommend you use it. So as Dr. Uh, Locke mentioned in her talk, um, you know, pulmonary fibrosis impairs the, ox your, the body's ability to absorb oxygen. And when your muscles are, when you're up doing things, your muscles rapidly use up oxygen. So your lungs always can't replace it sometimes. So sometimes your oxygen levels will drop. Um, and the further on your disease, the kind of the worse your disease is, the more oxygen you're likely to, to need. So we test your oxygen, you know, measuring your oxygen saturation monitor. And that's generally just the little finger clip we put on your finger to check your oxygen levels. Um, and we measure your oxygen saturations. Sometimes we'll put it on your forehead um, as well. But that measures the percentage of hemoglobin that's saturated with oxygen. And generally we say that number should be greater than 90, you know, kind of for purposes of this talk, that's what we'll say. Um, so a six minute walk test, most of you have had a six minute walk test as Dr. Locke mentioned in her presentation. Um, it's really important to look at a six minute walk test um, to measure your oxygen levels at rest. doesn't tell us a lot. You know, if your numbers are low at rest, then it tells us, well, yeah, your lung disease is severe enough to need oxygen at rest. But even so it's important to, 
ambulate you to see what your oxygen needs are when you're up and moving and doing things. So we do a six minute walk test. That's pretty standard in the interstitial lung disease world. Um, this is just kind of a cartoon uh, six minute walk test where uh, a patient, uh, when she first starts her walk test, her heart rate is 72 and her oxygen levels are 93%. And then by the end of the test at six minute mark, she is heart rate's 144 and her oxygen level 71. So this person certainly oxygen levels goes quite low. Um, we would certainly recommend in our clinic this person wear oxygen right away. Um, and, she's, and she is short of breath and we hope that that would certainly help her feel better and uh, hopefully allow her oxygen levels to stay normal. So really what are the goals of oxygen therapy? I think the goals are to maintain your functional ability um, by normalizing oxygen saturations, thus reducing your dyspnea, so making you less short of breath. Um, so what we're trying to do is correct or treat the exertional hypoxemia or the lower oxygen levels. Um, and then as the scarring worsens, um, you know, you may, you're likely to need more and more oxygen uh, specifically where, with exertion. So really what we're trying to do is allow you to walk, work, exercise, shower, um, get dressed, all of that safely with enough oxygen and hopefully with less shortness of breath. So allow you to do more um, with the oxygen. That's, that's the goal of the treatment. So I'm trying to find a way to, to uh, um, relay the fact that, you know, oxygen is a tool. Um, and, you know, maybe we say glasses for your lungs, you know, glasses help you see, obviously. Um, but I'm trying to reframe the way we think about supplemental oxygen because I think the first time people we talk about supplemental oxygen, the first time they think is like, oh, well, I have to drag a tank or a machine behind me and how's that gonna work? And, and uh, certainly that's all true. Um, but I think if we can think about um, how it's going to affect our lives and how it may, may be a, a tool to help us improve our lives and make it let us do more things, I think maybe we're going to have a, you know, think a little harder of that. We'll, you know, maybe we'll, we'll uh, think a little harder about fitting it into our lives and how that works. So specifically, oxygen equipment. Um, and, and what does that mean for you if you're prescribed supplemental oxygen? Well, generally speaking, you've got... Um, give you two forms of oxygen. You, 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 you have oxygen in your home, generally speaking, a home machine, and then you also have a portable option. So these, these little uh, machines here, these are uh, home concentrators. They're kind of about the size of a suitcase, a larger suitcase. And what they do is they, they're a machine that plugs into the wall and they, uh, they take regular air and they concentrate it into oxygen to around 95% and then it delivers to you through a, a, a tube that we kind of use called nasal cannula that goes into your nose. Um, and that's kind of up in the upper right hand corner. And so the, the home concentrators are great. They can offer, uh, so they're a stationary unit generally. Um, usually just have a big hose attached to it that kind of goes throughout your house. Um, they can give flow rates up to like zero to 10 liters per minute. That's how we, uh, determine, uh, that's how we measure your, the, the amount of oxygen you use. We, we talk in terms of liters per minute, and that's the flow that comes out of the, uh, the machines. Um, and we can actually sometimes double up those machines in, in certain cases where people can deliver up to 15 liters per minute. So um, that's generally about the max, about the maximum amount, amount of oxygen we can use or, or provide in, in the community. Um, then for portable equipment, we have options of portable oxygen concentrators, which is like this one in a brown bag here, or this little machine over here to the right. Um, these are portable oxygen concentrators. They are smaller machines that do the similar to the home concentrator. They make their own oxygen uh, and they deliver it to you through via, via your nasal cannula. Um, this, those are very nice. They're, um, the good things about those are they're very, they're very portable. Um, they plug into your car, they plug into an outlet. The good things about them is if you have power, you always have oxygen. You never have to run out. Uh, your tank will never really run out because you, you don't have a tank. Um, they're very portable. You can travel. Uh, you can take them on airplanes. Um, they deliver oxygen. Uh, one of the bad things about them is um, they only provide oxygen up to about two to three liters per minute continuous flow or up to six liters pulse flow. And I'll explain the continuous or pulse or intermittent flow in a, in a minute. Um, but that's one of the drawbacks to the portable oxygen concentrator. And then obviously they do run on batteries and they do need power. So if you run out of power, um, that, that's a problem as well. The other option for uh, portable uh, oxygen are compressed gas, um, excuse me, compressed gas. So that's where compressed oxygen is put into a tank. 
um, and they're delivered through a regulator, uh, the de desired flow. Uh, the good things about these is you can run flows up to 15 liters per minute. They come in a variety of sizes um, and they have multiple flow regulators that can help you deliver either pulse flow or continuous flow as well. And like I said, I'll explain that in a little bit, in a minute. Uh, the bad things about them is one, one once they're empty, they're empty. Um, so you, if you run out of oxygen, there's no way to plug them in. You've got you've to get have another tank with you or find another tank. Um, and some of the tanks, especially determining on the, the amount of flow you require, you may re the higher amount of flow or oxygen you're using, the more the bigger the tank you probably need to be out and about. Um, so and some of the bigger tanks can be quite heavy and burdensome that way. So that's one of the, the certainly the drawbacks to, to tanks. Uh, so flow rates. Um, so these are all pictures of regulators. The one in the bottom right hand corner is uh, an oxygen, uh, often oxygen concentrator. Um, so flare, flow rank, flow rates um, can we go up, like I said, zero to 15 liters per minute. Um, but depends on the regulator and the machine that you're using, basically. Um, there is a, a thing called continuous flow, which is what those home concentrators make. Um, they provide a continuous flow at say two or four liters per minute, whatever you set it at. And that is how much air is continuously going out, going out through that tube to your nose. That's how much your oxygen you're getting. A pulse flow or intermittent flow, um, that's where you have a nasal cannula into your nose. And every time you take a breath, there's a little sensor on the, on the regulator that gives you a burst of air or burst of oxygen um, through, that, through those plastic tubes. Um, and that's called intermittent flow or continuous flow. Now the purpose of that is it's a conserving device. So if you have an intermittent flow regulator on your tank, um, the, it's basically trying to preserve your tank so it doesn't run out quite as fast. Um, and the same thing with your portable oxygen concentrators. If you have it on uh, pulse flow or intermittent flow, it's a regulator, it's, a, it's trying to save your battery so it doesn't run your battery out of juice so fast as well. Now the downside of that is um, they may not be able to provide enough flow to you. So one thing I always say is um, two liters continuous flow and two liters pulse flow or intermittent flow are really not the same. Uh, this is a number I've kind of come up with in my head, but I generally say that pulse or intermittent flow is about half of continuous flow. I don't know if there's, you know, someone may have a better idea, but that's where I kind of generally start. And then I kind of work from there. So if you need two liters per minute at home continuous flow, uh, when you're walking to your car, you probably need four liters if you're using pulse flow. Um, and you may need even more yet because you're actually more active when you're out of your house, walking to the grocery store, walking to your car, those sort of things. And your muscles are using more oxygen at those times. So uh, it's really important to kind of know that it really depends. Your flow rates will really depend on, you know, what your activity level is. Um, and it's, it's also important to know, and, and you're, you're your physician and your respiratory therapist or your oxygen vendor can, can let you know what the flow rates should be. And they can give you some guidelines on what your flow rate should be uh, as well. And that's something that probably should also be um, re-examined uh, relatively often. So, you know, we often walk patients in our clinic when they come in with oxygen, just to see if they're, you know, getting enough. So it's, it's as simple as putting a, a probe on their finger and walking up and down the hall to see what their oxygen levels are. Um, next, oxygen saturation monitors, and do you need one? Um, I know a lot of people wear, you know, take these and they bring them into a clinic with them. Um, they're, they're quite handy devices. They're very simple to use. Um, they're easily found online for about $50 to $70. Um, you can pay up to $200 if you'd like. Um, and usually they're fairly accurate. Even the small $50 jobbies, they're, they're, they're very similar to what we would use in our, in our clinic. Um, give us similar readings. The one thing I find is they may take a little bit longer to pick up your pulse rate and your and your oxygen monitor or oxygen saturation, um, but otherwise they're 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 fairly accurate. They do they are um, you can uh, they can be sensitive to movement. So if you're actually walking or doing work and you got one on your finger, sometimes it may not uh, be quite accurate and can give you some unreliable readings that way. Uh, the other drawbacks are, as, as Dr. Locke mentioned in her presentation, people sometimes have Raynaud's disease or, or poor circulation to their hands. Um, and sometimes these machines won't pick it up if you've got a really um, cold hands. Um, sometimes it just doesn't work if you've got Raynaud's. Um, so I think they're a nice to have tool uh, if they're used appropriately. 
Um, and and so what what is important to know is what they will tell you and what they won't tell you. So what an oxygen saturation monitor will tell you is it will tell you your heart rate and it will tell you your oxygen levels at that time. So what you're doing at that time. What it won't tell you is how you're feeling. So I have a lot of times patients will come into our clinic and say, and I'll ask them how they're doing and how they're feeling. And the first thing they do is they, you know, put this thing on their finger and say, oh, my oxygen levels are 94%, so I feel great. Um, but that's really not what I'm asking. So really, um, these machines, you know, they're limited to what they can do. So how I recommend you use an oxygen saturation monitor. I, I think it's important to spot check your oxygen. Uh, if you've got one of these things, great. If you don't, when you come into your office or your doctor's appointment, you know, they can often spot check your oxygen as well and take you for a little walk, like I mentioned earlier. Um, but if you've got one at home, it's a little bit more applicable to your, to your everyday life. Obviously, you're not always walking on flat ground in the, in the doctor's office. Sometimes you're walking upstairs or you walk into the mailbox and there may be a hill involved. So it may, may need that you, you know, you need a little bit more oxygen in those situations. So what I recommend is, you know, if you're doing a certain activity, I would recommend wearing your oxygen at whatever the, you know, kind of your starting dose is, whatever the doctor or uh, respiratory therapist has told you, and then walk to the mailbox. Put the thing on your finger, walk to the mailbox, walk back, take a look at your readings. What are they? Uh, you know, if they're below 90, we would say maybe you need a little bit more oxygen, turn it up another, a, a number or two. If they're, you know, they're looking at 92, 93% and you feel good, um, then that's great. Um, put it away and go about your life and, and continue using your oxygen. Now, if you notice in three or four weeks that all of a sudden you're becoming more short of breath doing kind of similar things, if you're walking to the uh, mailbox and you're short of breath, well, take, put that thing back on your finger, walk to the mailbox and come back and now, you know, maybe it's 84%. Well, that might mean your oxygen needs are changing and you need more oxygen. So that's how you should use those. And the other nice thing about oxygen uh, saturation monitors, they're really good for travel. And I think, um, you know, a lot of times when people have supplemental oxygen, they're like, well, now I'm kind of tied to home and I can't go places very well. And I can't go on long car drives and things, or car rides and things like that. Um, well, you certainly can, it just, it becomes a little bit more cumbersome, but these machines, you know, if, if uh, it can help you titrate your oxygen. So if you're sitting in a car and you're, and somebody else is driving, you can sit in the passenger seat and your oxygen levels, you know, are staying above 90 and you can turn down your oxygen level to one or two or whatever. And if your numbers are okay and you're feeling okay, you can leave it at that. That'll allow your tank or your oxygen um, concentrate to last a little bit longer while you're out. And then just remember, if you are turning your oxygen levels up and down, remember that you're always going to need more oxygen when you're doing things. So when you get to your destination and you're having to walk into a, say a restaurant, um, you're going to need to remember to turn up your oxygen levels. <clears throat> um, and so that's the other, the other uh, useful point is for the oxygen saturation monitor is, uh, is using to titrate your oxygen. So advanced care planning. Now, uh, this is, um, I have one slide on this, and this is kind of a woefully inadequate summation of advanced care planning. And there should be a, a whole talk dedicated to this topic. Um, but this is something I, I said I, I wanted to talk about things I talk a lot about, but this is actually something we don't talk a lot about. And the reason for that is, is a lot of times it's time. Um, one, it's time, and the other one, people are just kind of avoid the topic because it's a tough top conversation to have. But advanced care planning is, is what it is, it's determining what your values and wishes are, um, determines on what sort of treatments you would like in certain situations, um, who you'd like to speak on your behalf and you're unable to do so? Would you like to be an organ tissue donator? Donate, uh, donor? Um, these are complex conversations. They're not as simple as, I don't ever want to be on a ventilator. Um, maybe that's the case, but if you're relatively healthy and all of a sudden you have a bowel obstruction, you have to go to surgery, well, they're going to have to put you on a ventilator. Um, so what kind of situations are you willing to do these things and what kind of situations are you not? Um, it's more complex than just, you know, you know, that nothing's black and white in this situation, I find. Um, so I think, and also because these conversations are so time consuming, um, oftentimes doctors and nurses will put these things off to maybe the next appointment or the next appointment. And it's difficult to do that because of time constraints. <clears throat> um, but I think if we can maybe prepare ourselves ahead of time uh, and by doing and by going to advancedcareplanning.ca, I think you can actually, there's a ton of resources on that. 
on advanced care planning. And you can have these discussions with your family right now. Uh, and then you can come into your doctor's office and say, okay, this is what I think, this is what I would like, you know, we, and, then, and then ask questions and we could have more of a, a detailed talk and more of a targeted approach towards advanced care planning rather than sitting down for, for an hour when the doctor only has 15 minutes with you or 30 minutes, you know, having this hour and a half long conversation is very difficult. So I think if you take one thing away from this talk that I'm giving today, um, it's that advanced care planning is, is super important. Um, I would say, ignore my oxygen talk, go to, go to advanced care planning. That's the number one thing you should do when you get home or when you get done with this uh, and have that conversation with your loved ones. Start having that now. Um, I think that's way more important than medications, oxygen, all those other things. This is gonna, it's, it's super important. All right, so that being said, I'm just now gonna kind of go over a few things. Um, and this is just kind of some, you know, quick little- Sorry, Kirk. Little Yes. If I could uh, interrupt you for one second. Uh, someone had a question. They were asking temperature extremes. Does it affect oxygen requirements? Yeah, I guess I, I, I'm not 100% sure. I guess I would know that if you're shivering or if you've got fevers, your, your, your body's going to use up more oxygen in those situations. Um, so yes, potentially in those situations, I don't know. A lot of people tell me that they, you know, they need more oxygen when they're walking in the car in the winter than they do in the summer. And I don't know if that's just a, um, why that necessarily would be. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's about all I know about that. Can I add a point in there? Sure. Um, barometric pressure. So if you're going up a mountainside, that will affect your oxygen. Um, so we can notice that people's oxygen will drop when they go up in an airplane. Um, or go up, you know, hiking or anything like that. So altitude or going up to a place that's not at sea level, if you live at sea level, like Calgary is actually at quite high altitude. So I will mention that um, temperature, not as much. So um, like if your fingers are cold, you'll notice your pleth is uh, different. And like Kirk said, I guess it, in extreme temperatures, but not so much. Thank you, Dr. Luck. Uh, the next question for Kirk or Dr. Luck is, is all oxygen options cover, you know, pulse and continuous that was mentioned in Kirk's presentation? Yeah, so I think, um, I think so. I know in Alberta here, it's, it, it really depends on, you know, I know the, a lot of the oxygen vendors would prefer that you guys are on oxygen concent concentrators, I think. Um, it's just because they're not having to deliver tanks and, and those sort of things. Um, so I think you have the option of what, what works best for you. And usually the oxygen companies will help you kind of say, you know, you need this much oxygen. You should probably be on, you know, a tank or you need this. You can probably get by with, with these portable concentrators. So I think that is kind of, yeah, I think you'll have an option either way. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, a couple other, just a few things. Um, so appointment times. So I think, it's really important that we're an active participant in our in our healthcare, um, and it's really helpful when people come to the uh, to your appointments prepared. So come with a list of a questions. First of all, come with your. Uh, oh, I'm having the same problem Dr. Locke was having. Uh, come to your um, question. There, come with a list of questions, and also come with your your caregiver, your spouse, your loved one, um, because they can help you be a resource at the appointment as well. Take notes. Ask follow up questions. Clarify your plan of care with the physician and your nursing team. Um, and don't be afraid to ask questions. And then find out who you're supposed to ask questions from or, or who you should call if you have further questions or have or problems or have questions about follow-up. So be an active participant in your healthcare is uh, super important. Medications. Um, so it's super also very important that we know what medications you're taking at all times. So um, make a list update it regularly. We need to know what medication you're taking, what your dose is, when you're taking it, and how you're taking it. Um, and bring this to your every appointment you see. I know a lot of people are like, well, I gave you the list last year. It should be the same. Well, 90% of the time, it's not the same. Something else has changed. So um, it's a really good idea to always have a list with you. Put it on your phone, whatever works. Um, understand the goals of therapy of your medications. Be mindful of the side effects. And I kind of mentioned that mostly for the uh, ESBRIT and OFEB because there are side effects uh, um, are common sometimes. So we want to just be mindful of what you're looking out for. Uh, and then lastly, I think is most importantly, speak to your pharmacist about your medications. Um, they're a vital uh, resource 
and they are the experts when it comes to medications. And I know a lot, I get a lot of questions about medication interactions and things like that. And I can certainly answer some of those questions, but really your, um, your pharmacist is much better and more qualified of answering those if you're, um, so I really think that's, that's the uh, best place to go for that. Uh, palliative care. Um, I know Dr. Mina Clare has given a talk on September 16th about palliative care and interstitial lung disease, and I would refer you to that talk for any detailed uh, discussions on palliative care, and Dr. Locke um, touched on this as well. Um, but I think it's really important to not be so fearful of palliative care. So understand that it is for symptom management, and that's essentially what we're, what we're trying to provide in that. And there's many ways to provide uh, palliative care, symptom management. You know, even when we're turning up your oxygen and titrating up your oxygen to meet your needs better, to make you less short of breath, we're essentially using palliative care. Um, it's not always, you know, we're, you know, I think it's traditionally thought of as, you know, palliative care is, you know, we're going to give you medications to make you comfortable and we're going to, you know, let you go in a few, you know, weeks to months. And, and that's not always the case. And that's, um, so there's, we're talking about symptom management here to help you, you know, feel better. So. Don't be too resistant to palliative care. And like I said, tune into Dr. Clary's talk for, for more information oh, on that. Kirk, I'm sorry, yeah. I, wanted, I need to ask you for another question. Uh, someone was wondering, is compressed oxygen as dangerous as liquid oxygen? And the second thing is, uh, they've never heard any warnings to avoid being around open flames, et cetera, with compressed oxygen. Oh, okay. Uh, absolutely, with all oxygen, you should avoid open flames um, and anything, any sources of ignition. So certainly, you know, don't smoke, all those sort of things. So now as far as is liquid oxygen more or less dangerous than uh, compressed oxygen, um, I wouldn't think so. Um, in fact, yeah, I, I don't really, I wouldn't think anything would be more or less flammable. It's, it's the same. Um, I know the compressed oxygen tanks, we do have to be a little bit mindful of those because, you know, if, if somehow if you drop the things, they could, uh, they could cause a problem as far as a projectile with the compressed oxygen. Um, but yeah, that's it. I think they're both, but yes, avoid open flames with both. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, my last bit is pulmonary rehab, but I'm uh, this. I put this in here before I realized that Melanie's going to have a whole discussion on pulmonary rehab, so I'm not going to talk on that. I'm not going to steal her thunder. Um, other than I will say, I know oftentimes people are short of breath doing things. They stop doing things. They become deconditioned. Now they're short of breath doing less things, and it's just this downward spiral. So it's the classic scenario of if you don't use it, you lose it. So certainly. Um, Pulmonary rehab is, is excellent and a, is, a, is vital um, to, to maintaining proper health. And Melanie is going to go over that in great detail. Uh, I have okay. another question for you, Kirk. Absolutely. Uh, someone wanted to know why would you use liquid oxygen? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually mention liquid oxygen, but I can talk a little bit about it because it's, um, um, it is an option. Uh, not a lot of places or not a lot of vendors carry it. Um, so usually you only have, you're limited to like one or two vendors. I know at least in Calgary, uh, in Alberta, usually it's just one or two vendors that actually have access to it or use it. Um, so liquid oxygen is gen, so it's, when, when oxygen is, is cooled, it turns into a liquid. So when it's really, really cold, it turns into a liquid and then it's stored in like a, I guess thermos for lack of a better term. And then it's delivered through a, through a regulator and, and it, it actually goes through these coils and it, 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 it heats back up to room air and it, it expands exponentially. So you can, liquid oxygen is really dense and when, it's, when it goes back to room air temperature, it, it, it expands exponentially so you have a lot of oxygen. So you can actually store a, a lot of oxygen in a little container. Um, so what it's beneficial for is people who are on high flow needs. So if they're really on a lot of oxygen, say eight or nine or 10 liters um, or more, you know, liquid oxygen will give you those higher flows rather than using those tanks up so quick. So it usually give you a little bit more time out of the house um, and a little bit more ability. Um, the drawbacks to liquid oxygen, um, you know, you need to physically be able to have a liquid oxygen storage thing in your building or in your house. And then you have to re, you have to learn how to re uh, fill your own containers, your own portable containers. 
and those portable containers, it's kind of like filling up a thermos, um, but they, uh, you know, they will actually leak liquid oxygen or lick, you know, as they cool or as they warm up to regular temperature, you do leak oxygen. So you actually, you can't fill them up ahead of time, I guess what I'm trying to say. Um, and I think that's the main, main things with liquid oxygen. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so back to support groups really quick. Um, you know, I know we're getting a lot of information from Dr. Locke and we've got, a, we got a, all these experts speaking this month to, um, you know, about pulmonary fibrosis. But really, I find support groups are where, where the real experts are and you guys are the real experts because you guys live with this disease day in and day out. Um, and, uh, and this is where you can really get a good sharing of information um, in support groups. Um, obviously, COVID has kind of made a mess of our support groups. Um, in some ways, you know, you kind of lose the in, in, uh, in-person meetings. Uh, however, you know, there's, we are now kind of going online with everything. Um, and so it's kind of changed the dynamics a bit. We've actually increased the accessibility um, for a lot more people are able to go to support group meetings if they, you know, have the techno technological uh, needs or, or um, resources. Um, so I really feel that support groups are, are super beneficial um, and I've certainly, in the last seven and a half years we've had ours in Calgary, I've learned, I've certainly learned more uh, information there than I've ever provided to, to people as well. So um, certainly they're great, they're great resources and their support groups now all over, all over Canada. So, you know, I think when our support group started, we were one of the first two, maybe two or three, and now there's, you know, a, a lot of resources. Um, <clears throat> attitude and mood, this can be a quick quick thing here, and I'm certainly not qualified to speak to mental health really in any detail, but I know enough to say, um, kind of recognize what's in your control and kind of focus there. Um, feels like I'm talking to my 12 and 14 year old daughters here this is what I seem to tell them every day. Um, but I think those are, you know, try to focus on what you can control. And then also know that fear, anxiety, grief, uh, anger, those emotions are, are really all normal. And it's a normal process that you go through when you're diagnosed. Um, but we need to recognize when they become abnormal. And I think um, that's super important. So if you realize, if they find that they're affecting, negatively impacting your life, uh, if you're not able to focus and sleep and, and uh, have, your, have normal relationships with your, with your loved ones, perhaps these uh, emotions are, are getting away from you and you need some, need some help, you need to talk to somebody. So certainly talk to your family members, talk to your doctors, um, maybe even a social worker who's trained with some illness adjustment uh, things uh, you can talk to therapists, psychologists. There's a, there's a lot of resources out there um, for, for that if you need it. All right, just a couple more slides here. What's an emergency? So this is one that I put in because I can't tell you how many times I've come in on a Monday morning after having the weekend off and I check my messages and I'll have a patient who phone and, and they sound terribly short of breath and they're, and they're telling me I can't breathe. I don't know who to call. I don't know what to do. Um, and Monday morning, 20 or 24, 48 hours later, I'm just hoping that they call 911. Um, and that's really all I can, well, all I can say. Um, I know this list isn't complete by any means, but these are, you know, some certainly medical emergencies. If you're having chest pain, don't wait around and call your physician, uh, your, your family doctor's office or anything like that. This is a medical emergency you need to have looked after quickly. If you're short of breath, acutely short of breath and can't, you know, can't catch your breath like you normally can, um, any loss of consciousness, you run out of oxygen. Say if you're on six or eight liters of oxygen and you have car troubles and you're, and uh, all of a sudden you are gonna run out, that's gonna be a medical emergency as well. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, if you're acutely unwell and you can't safely seek medical attention on your own, then you need to, you need to make sure you can call 911 and get some help. Um, don't drive yourself to the hospital in any emergencies, please. A quick one on COVID. I'm sure we're all aware of the signs and symptoms of COVID. Um, you know, COVID has really thrown a monkey wrench into, into our world, really changed how we do things. Um, you know, we now have to ask ourselves every time we leave the house, am I sick? Um, it's really no longer acceptable to go anywhere if you're sick. So if you're sick, stay home, wear your mask, um, stay informed, ask questions. Uh, be open to change, uh, especially back in the spring, we saw how things changed. You know, we weren't wearing masks, now we are, you know, everything has changed. So uh, as new information comes about, just understand that. And then lastly, we really have to be understanding that, you know, everybody's is affected by COVID in some manner. Um, some may be more than others, 
but uh, we've all, this is scary, it wears us down. Um, I know I've certainly had bad days and anxious days as well, um, but know that everyone's in a different boat and uh, we're not always dealing with the exact same situation. So uh, just be kind to one another. Last slide, um, advocate. Never be afraid to ask questions, um, um, asking for help. You know, always bring, you know, bring a loved one to your appointments. Um, you know, know what to do when you're falling through the cracks. If you feel like you haven't been, you know, you haven't heard from a doctor in a while, um, don't be afraid to ask for help and, and, and call somebody. Um, the last thing we wanna do is lose, lose contact with your, with your doctor uh, in these situations. Okay, so never be afraid to ask questions. So I don't know in the last 30 some minutes if I've uh, really filled your toolbox to this extent, um, but hopefully I've given you a few things to think about. And uh, that's it. This is the Telespark building in Calgary with the Calgary Tower in the background uh, lit up for September Pulmonary Fibrosis Awareness Month. So thank you. Thank you, Kirk. I want to ask our audience and participants, um, are there any more questions that you would like to ask him before we move on to the next um, uh, presenter? Oh yes, and somebody wanted to say, are these presentations gonna be on the CPFF website? Yes, they will. Um, in October, uh, we will upload all these presentations so that you can go back and review them again. And then we're gonna focus on webinars in the future uh, for those topics that people are more interested in. So if people say we would like to hear about mental health, then we'll find some experts to uh, present on that. And I just wanna say thank you, Kirk, very much. I've learned so much from your presentation and that's uh, been very helpful. Thank you, pleasure being here. All right, thank you. And now it's my uh, pleasure to introduce everyone to Melanie Stevenson. She's a graduate at the University of Saskatchewan with degrees in environmental earth science and kinesiology. Uh, she has dealt with asthma since the age of four and knows personally how to exercise, how much exercise helps in reducing flare-ups and controlling lung health. Currently a competitive cyclist and a mother of an autistic son who participates in the Special Olympics. Uh, she works with um, CDM and many of the programs offered, including rehab and education programming. Her goal is to empower people to do what they can to improve their health rather than just relying on medicine Medic medication and doctors and specialists. It takes work and effort, but nothing worth doing is ever easy. So I'm gonna send this off to Melanie Stevenson. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you, Stacy and Kirk. Those are really, really good presentations. And I'm always seems to be the last one. Exercise always seems to be the last thing that people wanna hear. So I really encourage you to really kind of Think about what I'm saying rather than just, you know, reading the words. Um, I know for myself, exercise has been really huge. I was never a competitive cyclist up until the last couple of years. So I'm an older adult becoming, an ex uh, becoming a cyclist. So it's never too late. And you don't have to be a competitive cyclist to get anything out of your exercise. So um, hopefully today's presentation will kind of help out. It's my first time doing a presentation on Zoom. Usually I like to be really interactive. So if I get a little bit, uh, my hands start working, that's my exercise for the day, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, today I'm hoping to talk about um, the active living benefits and barriers for you. And just making sure that, you know, it's, it comes on a plate that we live in a constant turmoil we don't live in an area where it's like everything's perfect all the time. So we wanna make sure that we can live within that turmoil and develop an active living space in that turmoil. Um, types of activity, exercise time and type, building a program, goal setting, and of course we work in the pulmonary program sector. So, you know, kind of taking a look at from our programs, but there's many different programs out there and um, across the world, a lot of them do really, really good work. So always a good thing to do. So benefits of exercise, a lot of people hear about the short-term benefits, right? It makes you feel better, more energy, decreases stress, anxiety, and fatigue, improves re relaxation, all of those really positive things. 
Um, I did put lower blood glucose. I know like if you have a condition like cardiac or um, diabetes, you know, they always hear about the blood glucose or blood glucose levels. But when we become inactive and we tend to sit and, and not actively, you know, get up constantly, we tend to keep what we eat in our bloodstream or it becomes our fat cells. So it's in kind of this process and without getting too complicated, it kind of goes always going between fat and blood glucose. And if your body's more active, it tends to put more stuff in your bloodstream so that you have more energy to do things. If you become more sedated or like sitting on the couch or, you know, doing not doing as much exercise, your blood glucose levels actually will kind of drop a little bit and, and be more stored because your body over centuries and centuries has worked on the fight or flight system, which means that it's going to store if it doesn't need to use it. Okay. Whereas if you just even being a little bit active, we keep the neurological system or your brain, which controls everything. It keeps the muscles pumping. It keeps blood flow going to all systems rather than just your core. So the reason why I put that in there is because it's something that we don't necessarily think about a lot unless we have the diabetes and cardiac problems, but it really is important in reducing your um, possibilities of getting those from being inactive. The long-term benefits, just like Kirk had said, our body is a use it or lose it system. There is no way around it. There is no magic pill. If there was, I honestly, I would be the first one to be on it. Like <laughs> sometimes we get so busy that I'm just like, oh, I'd like to take a break. And then when I take a break, it's way too much of a break. So just like everybody else, you know, you want to think of it as a long-term process. When we're doing exercise, it's not those, you know, I, I am not an advocate for those January, let's make a New Year's resolution because they are the most, they take away that empowerment, right? They create failure. And I always tell my clients, I said, there is no such thing as failure, right? It means that you found maybe a path that doesn't work for you. So we have to look at finding another path, okay? So it's just, it means that you've discovered a barrier. It's not a failure. But when we look at those January, you know, New Year's resolutions, you know, I, I work in the weight rooms, I work in our programs, and you know, by mid-February, everybody's gone. Why? Because they're hurting or they've taken on too much or they haven't done enough before. And so, you know, they think that they can go back to when they were 16 in high school and now they're middle-aged working at a computer sitting all day and they still think they can do what they did in, in high school and it's not realistic, right? So when we think of long term, we want to think of keeping at it in order to increase our endurance, increasing our mental focus, reducing our fear. Believe it or not, a lot of our fear comes from, it's kind of like that quick sound model that Kirk had displayed at the end of that um, slide there, where the more we fall into that funnel, the more fear we create of doing something because it becomes more difficult or it's harder to breathe or we're scared of falling, you know, and these are all realistic barriers. So, I mean, if anybody says, oh, it's just easy, it's like, absolutely not. I've been in that quicksand. It is very, very difficult to get out. And so usually what I tell people you know, if you find yourself in that quicksand state, right, just try and stop, right? Like any type of quicksand, the more you struggle, the, the worse it's going to get. And that's usually our first instinct as human beings is, you know, we're like, okay, I want to get out. So we work harder. And working harder is not the same as working smarter, okay? So we want to make sure that when we're doing these things, we want to empower ourselves. We want to make ourselves feel good. We want to make ourselves feel like we're, you know, just making ourselves feel like we're doing something that's worthwhile. And when we do that, then all of a sudden we find ourselves just making these little steps forward and little steps forward. 
until all of a sudden we just sit there going, wow, that's amazing. And that's the biggest thing I love about my job. When I see that progress and somebody, you know, they start off so hard and then, you know, six months later, they're like, I went grocery shopping all by myself. And I'm like, that is the most amazing thing. I'm going to tell you a true story. Sorry, a little bit of a tangent. Sometimes I do this, but I love the story. So I had this lady come in. She was one of my clients, super, super nice lady, lots of fear, never stepped in the room, like a weight room or exercise, you know, used to working at home. And she was like, we talk about goal setting, which I will go at the end of this here. And she's like, well, I'd like to do my laundry. She says, I have to, she lives in an apartment. She has to go down the stairs. So she'd always kick her basket down the stairs because she couldn't carry it. And then she'd tie a rope on it and kind of drag it upstairs. But she had to like take constant breaks. And she felt really demotivated. You know, she was scared of falling because she couldn't get up and down the stairs very well. And you know, those basic functions like cooking, cleaning, you know, we don't think about it in that use it or lose it sense. But really, when we lose those, we lose our independence, right? And so she had a lot of fear of that. And so coming to our program, we started off nice and slow at her pace. You know, we worked with her. Um, she's like, I'm not doing squats. After about three months, she's like, well, okay, maybe I'll try. You know, so we worked at her pace to where she felt comfortable. And in six months, she came to me and she's like, I, I really got to tell you something. And I'm like, oh no, what? what happened? Because anytime someone does that, I'm like, oh my goodness. And she's like, today I carried my laundry basket downstairs and upstairs all by myself. And I feel amazing. Right? So when we're talking about the long-term benefits of exercise, I'm not talking about cycling. I'm not talking about doing a marathon. I'm talking about doing your everyday activities which keeps our independence. And that is so important in just in so many ways. So by increasing that breathing muscle function, increasing those endurance, reduces the fear and those everyday functions that we you know, have grown up taking for granted now becoming harder, start to become a little bit easier, okay? So that's what I want you to think about in benefits of exercises. Not those marathons and all those really super exercise people, right? Some of us are. And, and for me, it's because I'm a very task-oriented person. So it helps keep me on task, right? But for other people, they just want to enjoy and there's nothing wrong with that. So keep that in mind. We also want to like think about the maintaining and losing weight, blood pressure, bones and muscles. But really that last point that improved quality of life, when we can keep our independence and we feel like we're not at the doctor's office every week and we feel in control of our own health or at least partially controlled in our own health, you know, our quality of lives go up. When we feel like we're always having somebody else control our lives and I'm not taking away from nurses or doctors or anybody like that, but sometimes we fall and myself included, we fall into that gap where we're just waiting for somebody just to tell us what to do and we want them to fix it. And sometimes it can't be fixed. Sometimes we have to live with it. And so when we exercise and we start taking control of our own selves, then that quality of life comes up because we can be ourselves, right? So it kind of gives that other perspective where we still need that guidance from our health professionals, absolutely 100%. But we also need to take responsibility a little bit with ourselves because guess what? When we see our doctors, yeah, we see them for half an hour, an hour, sometimes a once a month, sometimes every couple months, sometimes once a year. But you have to live with yourself. 24 7 you have to live with all the repercussions of what's happening so we need to be empowered right and that is the most powerful thing that you could ever do and no matter what ads are out there there is no one-stop shop there's no such thing it's more or less finding what works for you finding what you can enjoy and what you can do and being okay if you need to take a break okay you don't have to run a marathon. 
to feel like you can do a lot of things, even though, you know, like that person that I talked about, every time she did her laundry, it felt like a marathon, right? So that was her personal marathon that she was training for. So think about it that way. And when we think of training, think of the things that we have to do to do the things we want to do. And that is, I, I hold those words to my core. The things we have to do to do the things we want to do, right? Excuse me, And Stephanie. if you think back to work, yeah. Sorry, uh, there is a question that I wanted to uh, share with you to see if you could help this individual. Um, she said that uh, she could only tell from her heart rate and ox meter if she's overexerting herself. Um, her heart rate could be at 137 and her oxygen at 78, but she doesn't feel exhausted. But she's wondering um, during these during these you know exercise to keep her heart rate at 125 max and her O2 at 88 minimum. Um, she's afraid of hurting her heart and lungs. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing on that, that is we always want to start, let me back up here a little bit. We've grown up in the schools and everything where you have to give 110%. If you don't feel like you're working or you don't feel like you're doing anything, then we feel like there's something wrong and I'm not doing enough, right? But that is not true, okay? Even people who are training, like you, you see the Olympics and stuff, they're not always going out and like marathon runners, they, they don't run a marathon every day to train. They, um, speed skaters don't speed skate sprints every day to get faster. In fact, a lot of times to get faster and better, we actually have to go a little bit slower. We have to back off a little bit. So working at a lower intensity and then, you know, finding that threshold, we call it threshold. And everybody's is different depending on the body, depending on their experience. So your threshold might be at 125. And the reason why that's when your oxygen is below 80, it feels normal and you don't feel like you're exerting is because your body has adapted to feel like, okay, that's where I'm at. So I guess I must feel okay. But it's kind of like running your car on, you know, uh, partial oil, right? Or dirty oil. You're going to break down the insides. And that's something we can't see. And we can't always feel because our body likes to get to that level where it's like, well, if this is my normal, then it must be normal. When it's not supposed to be our normal. It's created a new normal. So you might find that when you're exercising, you're not working very hard and you're like, well, my oxygen is low, but in reality, the insides are struggling, right? Because they're struggling with a lower amount of, of um, oxygen than what it can actually use. So in one way or another, in order to keep your brain function and your core function working, it's got to steal oxygen from somewhere else, right? And most of the time it's from the periphery your fingers, your toes, your bone mass, you know, all those things that kind of the, the, the parts that aren't related to your organs that keep you alive. So think of it as this way, if your oxygen goes too low, you know, you're not helping your system, you're actually making it weaker than actually making it stronger, okay? And making it weaker isn't like strength training, right? Strength training, we tend to try and make it a little bit weaker so it adapts and makes it stronger. In this case, when we're dealing with less oxygen, your body's coping, so it's not making itself stronger. So my recommendation is pull back a little bit and, and find that part where you can be, you know, physically be able to stay in those guidelines, even if it does make you feel like you're not doing enough, because the body is doing enough. Does that answer? The, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. All right. So some of the barriers of exercise, and these are pertaining to most people, but it definitely is a barrier even more so when we deal with asthma, pulmonary fibrosis, like any type of lung issues, because you see that tired, fatigue, and uncomfortable, that tends to happen a lot quicker when we 
aren't kind of under normal conditions. Uh, time, fear, weather, environment. I know myself if there's like any kind of like this time of year is bad for me because with the um, farmers in the field, there's a lot of particulates in the air. Uh, the weather changes. Um, you know, all of those things can really bring in some barriers where one day you're feeling good and the next you're like, holy smokes, this is really, really tough. And then, you know, a couple other ones is like the knowledge and the cost. I mean, I've had to go to school for many, many years to learn what I need to know and I'm still learning. The more I learn, the more I realize how much more I need to learn. And so, you know, for someone to just read on the internet or, or to, you know, go to someone and that, you know, while it's, it kind of gives you a nice base on, on going out, there is a lot to know. And because of our, situ our bodies, which are, you know, there's not a one size fits all. You know, it's like going to the store. No, there's not one pair of jeans, right? Nobody fits the same pair of jeans. So how can we expect all these therapies to fit one person? They kind of fit the majority. And then if it doesn't work, then it's kind of this trial and error type thing till we find something that works or trying to work as best it can. It'd be nice if it was like Star Trek. And again, we could push a little button and everything's great. Um, but unfortunately, unlike the TV series out there shows, we do not have that technology yet. So we still have to rely a little bit on that trial and error and seeing what works best. And sometimes we just have to live with kind of where that threshold is and what we feel we can do. And the cost, a lot of people say, you know, I can't afford to go to the gym. You don't have to go to the gym. It's just for some people, it's a nice motivational factor because it's been proven in the literature that when there's other people around, even if you don't know them, you're going to work a little bit harder, whether that means you walk a little bit farther or, you know, you tend to like, yeah, okay, maybe I'll do a few little squats and a few little extra exercises. So sometimes, you know, a cost can be monetary, but a cost can also be am I actually going to be able to do it, right? So the cost of um, doing it at home might be that you tend not to do it. So that can be, think of it in that aspect as well. Physical activity can be as powerful as any medication with fewer side effects. And the side effects can actually be more positive than negatives. So again, it really depends on the person. We never start at the top. We always start at the bottom. And again, I'm not saying don't take your medication and I'm not saying that exercise replaces medication. Absolutely 100% not. But what I mean is that if we just rely on medication, sometimes we have a better, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A better response by the body when we combine medication with exercise. So all of a sudden we start feeling way better and we can do more and when we can do more then the medicine works better we're able to do more and exercise and again so now we start crawling out of that um, quicksand but i want to really emphasize that it takes time this does not happen in a week this does not happen in two weeks um, if you have a background in sports or a background in physical activity it can happen a little bit quicker but for most people, it takes at least a year to find a really good routine, to find something that works and to find something that really helps to improve things. So it's not an overnight thing. And that's why a lot of people like the medications because sometimes it can be very quick to feel that positive and exercise, you know, you might feel more energetic. You might feel like, yeah, I just feel a little bit happier, but to make body changes, we need time. Oh, got it. So physical activity is broken down into a couple different levels. We want to think about it in terms of work and leisure time. Uh, I know some of the people on this webinar may not work anymore, or maybe they volunteer. Volunteer is the same thing as work-related activities, so it doesn't have to be paid work. It just means things that we're doing to help or, or to go out and do things that are you know, scheduled. Okay. Hi, so Melanie. So they're sitting time. Sorry. Yep. I uh, just That's wanted okay. to, uh, someone online wanted to share that uh, they had 
they have um, good success with a friend in another city using video mm -hmm. on their mobile phones to connect with each other at the same time uh, as each of them exercise to a YouTube video. Absolutely. And we see that more and more because we, you know, especially with lung conditions with COVID, you know, we're trying to you know, back off being in those bigger bubbles for now, right? So absolutely, buddy systems, I love buddy systems. Because there's been times too where I've like, oh, I don't wanna do my workout and then there's like two other people that are relying on me and I'm like, okay, and we all get there or we're all online. And they all say, oh, I was waiting for you to say I didn't wanna do it, but I'm here. So if, you know, it works, it is fantastic. So thank you so much for that story, it's awesome. And I love it. So I love hearing success stories like that, it's fantastic. And that's, that goes into even the work-related activities, right? You, you hear people, you know, physically active time. It might be for coffee break, they walk downstairs and then they walk back up instead of taking an elevator. Or they might you know, go for a lunch hour walk and eat while they're walking or, you know, or, or taking a break. Um, leisure time activities. This is generally where people have the structured exercise fitting in. Um, and this could be lunchtime as well. You know, however it fits in your day, <clears throat> but it kind of takes, you'll see that sitting is almost half the time, whereas structured active time is about the other, you know, two thirds, and then the structured exercise maybe a little bit. So it doesn't mean that structured exercise is all of your physical activity. And yet when I talk to people about exercise, it's the one thing that they key on, right? So it really, if you look at it from a, an overview, structured exercise is a smaller component. It's important, but it's a very smaller component. And so, yeah, using those video buddy systems or um, like I had a, uh, one lady that I, I was helping and she's like, I hate being on the treadmill, but I don't want to walk on the ice because here we get a lot of you know, snow banks and ice and it can be really treacherous in the winter. And so what we did is, in the fall, she walked with her grandson who had a GoPro and they recorded her favorite walking path along the river. And then we put a video to it and even music because she didn't want to look at the time or whatever. And she put her earphones on and she didn't even look at the time. She just walked on the treadmill until she completed that loop visually. And she said, like, that was the best thing ever because she's like, I didn't have to look at the clock and it looked like I was moving. And they set it to really nice music because her son was able to do a lot of technical stuff. So take advantage of technically good people. I'm not technically, I'm technically challenged. So I rely on my daughter and my husband a lot. Um, but there's more than one way to make it enjoyable. So yeah, it's, you know, there's lots of options. Sometimes we just have to get creative. So physical activity is all the things we do. That's, you know, housework, walking for groceries, and it's basically things that keep us moving. Exercise is the planned and structured part of moving, okay? And it really does help our improve our health and well-being. So exercise is supposed to be a little bit tough. And tough doesn't necessarily mean breathing heavier. It just might be more moving muscle and doing things we don't normally do to get an adaptation. So the least amount of health benefits is when we're not doing anything. That's the sedentary uh, lifestyle. And the most health benefits is very active three to five days a week. Now, if, if you look on that continuum, you'll notice that it goes from zero, zero to one, one to three, three to five, and you can keep going up to seven days a week. And this isn't training, this is being physically active. So we don't start at the top, we start at the bottom, right? If you're at zero days per week, we look at trying to get it, you know, one. And then if you feel like you can do one, then we add two. And so even in our programs, it allows people to come five days a week, but we never, never, never start them five days a week. Uh, we start where they feel comfortable and the amount of time as well. So think on that continuum. You don't start at the back of the arrow and just immediately go to the front. It's moving along that continuum, okay? And sometimes we have to go backwards, but sometimes we have to pause. So it's the time scale. You'll notice I have no time scale on there because it's kind of as you're able to, because for example, you know, in the summertime, look in California, there's a lot of people there that can't do a lot of physical activity because the smoke is so bad. 
right? And then there might be other days where it's super, super clear and they can do a little bit more. So sometimes we have to be able to be a little bit more mobile, even in our time, as much as it is in person. Now, don't get scared by these numbers and that this comes from the Canadian Diabetes Association, but it is also part of our um, exercise association. Um, but this is where I pulled it from because we tend to use this data a lot for our exercise programs. So 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic exercise a week, and then three sessions of resistance or strength training exercises per week. Most people, and that's across the board, healthy people as well, most people do not meet these requirements. They might walk or do things for 150 minutes, which falls into that physical activity area, but moderate to vigorous activity, most people don't like getting into because it's uncomfortable or maybe they can't get into there because they don't have, uh, for example, pulmonary people. You might have to get an exertional oxygen prescription to help keep the oxygen level up when you exercise. So like that question um, a few slides before, you know, if, if you're finding that it's really, really light and you're not getting any benefit, you might have to go on supplemental oxygen for exercise. And we have many people in our program that do that. They normally don't use oxygen, but they have to use it for exercise. So if you're finding that you can't get into that moderate to vigorous intensity because the oxygen drops, then that's where you go and talk to your doctor, or your uh, special care person to do an exertional oxygen test to see if that would help you so you can get into those zones. All right. And then the resistance exercises, those are basically to help your muscle and your bone mass. Okay. So I would say out of these two things, you know, most people will find it easier to get into that aerobic and vigorous because they tend to be able to at least walk or sit on an exercise bike. Resistance exercises are very tough for me to convince people to do. So it's much harder to build. So we tend to build that, you know, after the first week or so of attending program and then we work with them on that so here's just some ex you know physical activity taking the stairs working in the garden mowing your lawn um, in this part of the world shoveling sidewalks is exercise <laughs> so um, we tend to put it in the exercise because people you know it's lifting especially when it's kind of wet snow um, if, if you're doing like a snowblower, then it would be physical activity because for the most part, the snowblower does a lot of the work. But if you're, sh you're shoveling the snow, it would be in the exercise because it's going to make you um, breathe heavier. And you'll notice at the bottom, it says 10 minutes at a time. You can even do five minutes at a time. So when you're first starting out, it's cumulative. So if every hour you do five minutes or you walk around, we have some people even just walking around their complex. Or, or walking up and down the hallway five times, you know, any amount helps. Start with small and build it up. And once you can do 10 minutes at a time, then you can break it up again and see if you can do, you know, two boats of five minutes and then, you know, increase those to six to seven to eight. And then all of a sudden you're at two sets of 10. So you can build it that way. And one of the questions that I tend to get is, do you get more benefit from doing it all at once or by doing it a little at a time. And I, I always tell people, I said, depends where you're at. If you like to do it all at once and you can, you're gonna get more of that endurance base because you're be, gonna be able to do things for longer periods of time. If you're doing it in short bouts, it's kind of like a sprint, right? You'll be able to do it for short periods of time and then you'll have to take some breaks. But people who tend to try and do it all the time, so let's say, let's even take 30 minutes. Think to yourself, is it easier for you to think about scheduling something for 30 minutes? Or do you think, you know what, I can schedule something for five minutes? Because even five minutes is between TV shows, right? So if you like watching your TV shows, every time one ends, go do five laps in your hallway and then come back and you can watch your next show. Nine times out of 10, the person who does it in small segments will be way more successful than the person who does it all at once. And somebody um, did a study as well and said that not just compliance in, in terms of being able to stay with the program, 
but the people who tend to do it all at once because they sit for the other 23 hours of the day have negated everything they've done in that hour or half hour. Whereas the person who's doing it throughout the day is actually getting more because they're keeping the body systems running all the way through the day, right? So think of your car, if it just idled for an hour, right? And then you start driving, it's kind of sluggish, right? Whereas somebody who like, you know, you stop and go and stop and go and stop and go at traffic lights. I know we all love traffic lights, um, but it always has a full, like the, everything's ready to go. It's, it's on running. It's like, okay, you know, as soon as you step on that gas pedal, it's ready to go. So think of it that way. Excuse me, Melanie. Um, there's a question yeah. online. It says, what would you recommend if there are no therapy programs available locally? Absolutely. Um, actually, with COVID now, uh, you don't necessarily have to have a local program. Our programs is, um, are running basically through the amount of, like I'm from South, uh, Saskatchewan, but we're helping people across the province. So they're not even coming into program. We're doing it over the phone. We're doing it virtually. There are a lot of virtual programs. For people in Canada, we are uh, referring people a lot to like uh, University of Toronto has set up some really good exercise programs online. Um, if you talk to, if you're looking like at a personal trainer level, you want to make sure that they're a certified respiratory educator, which is what I am, which involves going for an exam to make sure you understand all of the ins and outs of not just exercise, but exercising with oxygen, exercising with medications, all of those extra things. So if you just go to a regular personal trainer, most personal trainers in the gyms don't have a degree or they're working on a degree in something else and it's kind of their part-time job or they've done competitive in a certain sport, um, but they don't have any training dealing with um, people who have health issues. So you want to make sure that, especially with pulmonary fibrosis, if you are on oxygen, you want to get somebody that has a certification that can work with people who have those breakdowns. Um, in Canada, it's a certified respiratory educator mixed with a certified exercise physiologist. Around the world, they, um, again, that's through the American College of Sports Medicine. So I think through the state, that's also the same. I'm not sure what it is across um, across the sea um, but generally a lot of research kind of dances around that anyway so if you don't have access um, you know you can talk to your specialists and there are lots of you know even occupational therapists or um, respiratory therapists there are ones that do do some telephone calls online stuff that they can kind of get you going and, and find the resources because with COVID now, there's a lot more available, thankfully. Um, but just doing, I wouldn't recommend just doing Google searches because a lot of them are for, you know, even looking up exercises, you see the big buffy guys and you see, you know, all the people doing CrossFit and, you know, it, it's okay. But they're, they're assuming that you're healthy when you're doing those. So you can run into some problems pretty quickly. Um, there is, uh, again, I think I saw on Kirk's um, thing, there was a lung association, um, some of those lung websites. Um, they are really good uh, resources to find where, you know, you can talk to somebody about it. Um, so there's not always rehab programs available, but there is generally those support groups out there and like, you know, you can do it virtually now where, you know, people would come together just like we are here, where they might follow a plan or, or might do some things and people can do some education. So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea. Um, there's no one concrete answer. It kind of depends on location and, and country. But I know for Canada, um, the Lung Association or, or Lung.ca, really, really, really good website to give you some resources on that. Any other, if that's okay? Yep, thank you. All right. So we've kind of gone through this a little bit. Join a friend, start slowly. I really like the second point, choosing activities you enjoy. 
we always think of going to the gym, you know, like, and, and I know most people, even my generation, I never grew up as the gym generation, right? Um, I grew up with no computers, you know, we took our baseball bat and a, whatever ball we could find and, and cardboard pieces and we laid them over the diamond or we used our shoes to make soccer nets and, you know, we, we just went out and did things, right? And now we're in a, in a society where, you know, everybody goes to the gym and, and everybody follows uh, VHS, or I shouldn't say VHS, oh, I just dated myself, VHS. <laughs> um, online uh, videos and, uh, you know, things like that. And it, it's just a different world. So when we're trying new activities, it can be very scary. So if you're trying something new, maybe see if there's a couple rec programs out there that you can join in and make sure they're beginner level. I know in, in Saskatoon where I live, there are lots of what they call Freedom 55 um, activities where you can go to the leisure centers and they're specifically for people who are over 55 or have limited accessibility. So that might be something that you need as a little bit more support that way. Or maybe you'd like going for a walk or being by yourself. So finding something that fits that, right? Basically, we just want to reduce those long periods of sitting. And if you like what you're doing and you like, you know, it's a lot easier to motivate yourself. I don't like going into a pool because it makes me feel very cold. Can I do it? Yes. Am I motivated to do it? Absolutely not. <laughs> so everybody you know, has their pros and cons and what they like to do. So find something that you like and, and just keep moving, right? So we have aerobic, which you've kind of talked about, walking, dancing, skating, all those things, increasing the heart and the lung. Again, you're not going to start like the swimmer going full out. It might be putting a flutter board underneath and a pool noodle and just kind of kicking your legs and just going at a nice, easy pace, right? Um, again, it's, it's not too difficult to do aerobic. It's just putting in time. And I say it's not difficult because there's lots of options with just even walking, right? You can walk in the malls, you can walk in your hallways, you know, you don't need any fancy machinery. Where most people struggle is the resistance training because this helps your muscles and your bones stay strong. It also helps improve posture, which are seats. I remember my, uh, my physiology prof, she always said, she said, there's a reason why in the past only kings had seats, right? And you look at them and, you know, everybody who didn't have a seat stayed strong and were able to exercise and were able to do stuff. And exercise, I mean, you know, work in their fields, that kind of thing. And like chairs destroyed our posture. So you want to make sure you try and focus on I love the question of how many sit-ups does it take and absolutely zero sit-ups. We don't even teach sit-ups anymore. What we want to try and do is straighten the body, not kink it anymore. So, you know, strength training with the core, your glutes, your posterior chain, which is basically your butt muscle, your hamstrings, because really a lot of knee pain and hip pain comes from actually a very weak core. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have anything wrong structurally, it just means you don't have anything to hold those joints together. So your joints are rubbing and creating pain. Okay. Um, body weight exercises, I find are harder than any exercises lifting weights. So, you know, body weight exercises at home, fantastic. You don't need a gym, right? You can also buy resistance bands, which are like those nice big stretchy bands and they work really well. And most physios have those too. So you know, if you go to a, a someone who, like an occupational therapist or a, um, someone like myself who's an exercise therapist, you know, we can give you a workout that you could do at home. It doesn't take, uh, you know, having a home gym, right? Which means that you don't have to pay a lot of money. You just have to make sure that you do it. And then the flexibility. Some people like yoga. Um, in Canada, a lot of people like curling. Um, and, and daily stretching might be just Finding a place and feeling good might be putting your arms above your head sometimes or leaning back on your chair or, you know, giving yourself a nice big hug. Who doesn't like a nice big hug, right? So flexibility is just being able to move around the joint. And again, just like that quicksand, the less we move around our joints, the more stiff they get and the more pain we get from it.
We use the FIT principle to start. So if, if you don't remember anything else I talk about in this presentation, try and remember this one. We call it FIT principle. And it is basically the founding of all of our programs here. Um, frequency, intensity, time, and type. When I ask people, I say, well, you know, what is the most important? And everybody says intensity, right? Even in January, those you know, people coming into the gyms and you see them and they're like, I'm going to run. So what they do is they start running at like the level that they were in high school and in two weeks they have shin splints and sore ankles and back hurts. So we, intensity is always the last thing we change. It is never the first thing. The first thing we do is we pick the type. That should be number one, okay? Type is always number one because you wanna find something that you're going to like. So it's not even putting a time to it yet. It's like, do I like walking? Okay, well, let's try it. And it might be, oh, I like walking, but I can't really do it. So maybe I'll try the bike or maybe I'll try going to Apple Walk or maybe I'll try going to, you know, with a friend and just kind of like, you know, doing marches in my chair. You know, finding something that you can do and that you will be faithful in doing. The intensity is last, and that's where we start changing on how hard we do. The frequency is how many times per week, and the time is how long we're doing that exercise. So time and frequency tends to be interchanged depending on the person. Sometimes they say, you know, I'm not going to worry about time. I'm just going to try and do it once a week and then twice a week and three times a week. So even if it's five minutes, then we're good. And they're just trying to do it every day to get on a routine. And then they might say, okay, now that I can do five minutes, maybe I'll try and do six minutes or maybe twice a week I'll do 10 minutes and then the other ones I'll do five minutes. So we only want to increase 5% a week. And some weeks you're going to have to stay the same. But when we're increasing any of these, it's by 5%, which means, you know, if you're doing a type, don't try three things all at once. Give it a good one or two weeks to know whether or not you can handle it. So aerobic exercise, three to five times a week, two to three for resistance training and stretching, you know, moderate to hard, to the point of tension. Remember that this means, this is where we want to get to. So this isn't where we're starting. Remember that continuum we had, we wanna start at, if we're starting from zero, we don't go to three to five times a week, we go to that zero to one. And then we go to one to three, and then we go to three to five. So this is our end goal. And what I usually tell people when we're talking about goal setting, which we'll get into right away, is don't pick all three. Pick one. It might be you start with stretching, right? Because you have more pain, so we need to do a little bit more stretching to make sure those joints are a little bit more mobile. And then we add whatever you feel you can. So this is kind of the end point or how we build to this program. And it's doing what you can at the beginning. So in our program, we take about a week and see where you're starting from. Once we know what you're starting from, then we add that 5% to it. So until we can try and work up to this. Does it mean if you don't get to this, you failed? Absolutely not. Because anything is better than nothing. And trying is absolutely good, right? Because like Yoda said, do or do not right? You either do it or you don't. And trying, I mean by, you know, trying to hit this point, but you still have to do something, okay? And then we use the talk test in our program. We don't use heart rates. We don't use anything because we want to be able to make sure we're having a conversation. So this is really important for people with pulmonary fibrosis or any lung condition, because if you're finding you can't talk to somebody, then obviously your oxygen is not going to be at the right position, right? So even without a monitor, you can do this quite easily and it doesn't cost anything. And then you'll be able to know where you're at. If you do have a monitor, then you can see where you're at. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm taking a lot of deep breaths and you look at it and you're like, oh, my oxygen's still at 88 or 90%. Great. So then we know that you're working in the moderate to hard. If you're like, I can't talk to somebody and your oxygen's at 72, then we know we're working way, way, way too hard. Okay. And again, this can change depending if you are just deconditioned or you might need that extra oxygen supplement to help keep those oxygen levels up. And so that's where that trial and error comes in. 
In our program, we do a six minute walk test, just like the other programs that you heard. Um, but again, if you don't have access to programs, you're not gonna have that available. So this is what we add. This is what's part of our six minute walk test is the talk test to see if you can actually um, speak. It's one of our secondary things. So you can keep that in mind. If you can converse with somebody when doing a steady state exercise, then you're in a good position, okay? That's moderate. So making it a priority, fitting it into your day, you want to make sure that you're trying to make this a lifelong process okay it's not a one shot because you might get to a point where you're like yay i reached my goal and then if you stop you're just going to go back again so we want to make sure that we're doing something that we can continue on so i just want to touch on goal setting because we want to make successful lifestyle changes it's going to guide us in our journey. So if we come up to a barrier, it's not a failure. It's we have to pick a different plan. And it helps us to figure out what we want to do. Um, you know, I know for myself, sometimes you set those goals and then your goals change as you go through the journey. And you're like, I know even with this job, I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to be, you know, an exercise therapist, but I'm going to go into the sport field. And then I did a practicum in cardiac rehab. And I'm like, okay, I'm changing my goals. I loved cardiac rehab. So even our biggest journey or even our smallest journey, it might be going to the grocery store and it's like, you know what, I'm gonna go get some different fruit this time. So I'm gonna go down a different aisle or I might walk through the aisles first before I start getting my groceries. So it's just changing the journey a little bit and being okay with that. So it can help you make the changes that you wanna make, not just like we say the managing diabetes, but also like managing um or and i borrowed this from our um, diabetes talk so that's why it kind of got stuck there but i really liked it um, because it improves your overall health so we want to think of it as like an overall rather than it being just a really small point it's like just exercise it it, it kind of goes into everything of our lifestyle so we want to decide what we want to accomplish and goal setting is really tough because most people when we start talking about goals the first thing people do is like, I want to lose weight or I want to, you know, be able to do my laundry. And it's like, well, that's great. Those are really nice, broad goals. But we, we want to set activity goals and specific, they have to be specific. So what might be, I'm going to walk for five minutes. Where would be in the hallway? When would be in between my favorite TV shows? How? I'm going to walk. Um, or some people might be, you know, I'm going to use my, my cane or my walker or something like that to help so that if they get tired, they have something to sit on. And then the, um, one thing that a lot of people don't put into the goal setting that I like is who's going to support you? Yes, you have to do the work, but having that support system, buddy system, um, somebody that you report to, those things really help keep us on task because we know if that somebody's relying on us to do that with them or or having a buddy system it's fantastic because we go well i guess i'll do it <laughs> which helps right if it gets you to do it fantastic i use it all the time so keep it comfortable and only accomplish what you set out to do in terms of like i'm not saying that you know go out and burn out and do everything because that's what a lot of people do we, we tend to be that uh, what we call crash and burn right we tend to go out too hard because we're like i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do this i'm really motivated and we go out so hard we just kind of fall off the end so start comfortable see what we can do then accomplish those goals based on what you can do now and just upping it up a little bit okay so if you want to get in the pool and you want to swim Maybe you can't yet. Maybe it's just getting in the pool and kicking your legs, you know, hanging onto the edge for 10 minutes or five minutes. Or maybe it's doing the aqua walk first or, you know, holding onto a flutter board. So bringing it down into smaller pieces that you can actually accomplish and that you know when you've accomplished. So being realistic, not what we'd like to do in our head, because I know even in my head, my head keeps telling me that I can still do the same thing as a 20 year old. And my body's like, ah, no, right? So keep that in mind. Our, our body likes to play tricks on us. So, 
So setting weekly or daily goals, we call them action plans. Short-term goals are really important. And I love the staircase analogy. So I always think of it that, you know, we need certain steps to get to a certain goal. Some goals require shorter steps. So for example, making supper, it's like, well, I need groceries. I need to pick what I'm going to eat. I need to make sure that I have all the dishes clean enough that I can cook with it. And then I have to know how many people are coming. So even our most basic, basic life functions have a lot of steps to them. So if we think about that, it means if we're looking at our long-term goals, there might be a lot of steps. So we might take our long-term goal and bring them into much shorter term goals and short-term goals can be two weeks. Short-term goals can be up to three months. So think of it that way. Okay. And it's more or less to help you with progress because I don't know about you, but I love check marks. And I think that just comes from, you know, when kindergarten, when I got the gold stars or the, the check marks, you got a sticker, you know, I still love stickers. <laughs> so it's just, you know, anything that makes you feel just a little bit better and they can be silly things, right? But if it makes you feel good, oh yeah, it's fantastic. So, you know, how much you're going to do, when, how many days a week, again, same thing, just trying to make it that you can do it, right? And so if you do this, for example, walking around the neighborhood, 20 minutes, lunch break, three times a week, if at the end of the week you say, you know what, I didn't do it, I wasn't able to do it. What was the biggest barrier? Well, I didn't have 20 minutes. By the time I ate my lunch, I only had 10. So then you would change that how much to 10 minutes. Because if we keep feeling like we're not accomplishing it, we're not going to keep doing it. So we want to make it so that it pushes us a little bit, but we're still able to accomplish, right? So if you go down to 10 minutes and you're like, well, I did it for 10 minutes for five days a week. Well, that's great because you can always do more if you feel like you can. But we always want to make sure that when we're making the action plan or our goal for that week, that it is in that level that we can actually accomplish it and we can do a little bit more if we want to, but we don't want to be have that point where we are doing less. So be flexible. We might have to reset goals. We might have to modify, like I said, and we might not be able to do 20 minutes. You might have to go down to 10 minutes, right? But really try and find that um, willingness to try new things too, the challenging situations. You know, don't just be that all or none thinking, right? And I fall into this all the time. It's like all or none. It's like, if I can't do it, I'm not doing it. And we get stuck in that rut a lot. And so, especially when we have a big barrier, like not being able to breathe well, or, you know, in sometimes a year, it becomes a lot harder, right? So, you know, you have to find something that works for you. So if you can't go outside, well, what can I do, right? Especially right now, it's really tough to get convince people to leave their homes because there's so much fear out there. So you have to try and think of creative ways of getting out, creating ways of doing things that suit you, but also that you, know, you can still do the things you need to do. Because if we don't, we're gonna run into more problems than we've ever had. So we call it the SMART goal setting, achievable, measurable specific realistic timely and by time let you want to be meaningful and rewards should reinforce your goal like i always use the analogy of you know if somebody's like okay if i do my exercise i'm gonna have a hot fudge sunday and it's like that's not really helping you right but somebody might be you know what if i did my exercises all week i'm gonna go buy that really nice t-shirt that i see in the in the in the store and i'm, I'm gonna treat myself to buying myself a nice new shirt and then, you know, the reason why that reinforces it, because every time you wear that shirt, it's going to tell you, you know, it's going to remind you is like, I reached my goal to do this. So it has a double enhancement. Whereas like, after you eat the Sunday, it's gone, right? So there's, there's nothing there to keep reinforcing. So you want to have something that's going to continually remind you of that, you know what, I, I overcame a barrier here. This is awesome. I'm going to keep doing it. So this is just a little bit of our pulmonary program, which runs alongside with the cardiac program. Um, so it's a supervised exercise and education program. Um, all together, um, our pulmonary program and our cardiac program together, we probably have about 3,000 participants. 
it'll come all at the same time, but we have an evening program, morning program and an afternoon program. So we have exercise therapists, there's oxygen available for those who have a prescription, instructor leads. Um, the really important thing that I find for people is like a lot of the barriers is just getting there. So having other participants there that are going through the same thing is huge in, in motivating people to be able to take part. And I even had one lady, it was hilarious. I loved her response. And she's like, I'm not here to exercise. I'm exercising. But she's like, I'm here for the coffee afterwards. She's like, I'm there. So I might as well do some exercise, but it was all about the coffee after. So, you know, it's kind of like as a professional, I want to like tell you like, yeah, exercise and do all this stuff. But on a realistic level, nobody goes out there to like, I need to train and I need to do my exercise. Everybody who does this is like, they like the social and it really helps them mentally. And it really helps to motivate them that that extra person there just to support is fantastic. The other thing our program does is we have referral to other health services. So we have dietitians, we have mental health workers, we have pharmacists, all of those set up as well. So we do have some of those nice keys. And this is just an overhead view of our, of our program. So you can see that our table and, and you can see the exercise class and the kind of the green area on the left side and people exercising in the gym. We also have a, a cardio room underneath where people have new steps and bikes and people walk around the track. So this is probably during one of our busy, so the yellow and the red shirts are our cardiac program and the other people are mostly our pulmonary program. Okay. So it, it really is a very awesome program and it, I can tell you honestly that since the day I started working here, it has been the most amazing job and the most fulfilling job ever. And it helps me just as much, I think, as it helps them. So that's everything kind of in a nutshell. Um, hopefully you learned something. It, I honestly could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. I'm very passionate about it. So I'm hoping that it kind of helped you a little bit. Um, I know it probably didn't give all the answers maybe, but um, you know, I, I really, it's a process and it's a journey. So if you can think of it as a journey and a process, and just um, kind of like Kirk had said too, going through and asking those questions and being your own advocate is huge because not everybody has access to a program, but all of specialists have access to the resources to help you, which we use at our program. So it is out there. It just, you might have to go through a different route to get it, okay? Well, great. Thank you so much, Melanie. I really appreciate this session. I've learned so much. In fact, you've motivated me because I'm one of those people that think, oh, I, I can't do this. But now that, you know, learned from you, like, yeah, okay, I could do 15 minute increments. I can do that. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, from our audience, are there any questions that you would like to ask Melanie? It doesn't look like there is at the moment. Um, but anyways, I want to thank uh, Dr. Stacy Locke, uh, Kirk Matheson, and Melanie Stevenson for their presentation today. And I want to thank Peggy McKinney for um, getting all three of them to come on because uh, I know that, um, you know, it, it helped me a lot to get the sessions on and they've been so informative. So thank you so much, everyone. And um, have a great evening and come back for next week with uh, Dr. Carrie uh, Johansson on oxygen and polymerase fibrosis. And as Kirk had mentioned, uh, Dr. Mina Kalari on polymerase fibrosis and palliative care. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Mm -hmm.